Oh. Right, I've got the pictures of the web in the, 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 the what do you call them? The, the pictures. Do you, are, do you, how familiar are you with this end of Saint Paul? Uh, this is the first one for me. First <laughs> one for you. It's, hey, Sparky Ninja Dad. Phil, how are you doing? His, his audio I'll is just say, open. boys, I've just shaved my hair and my beard for you. I know we know this. I shaved this morning too. <laughs> just for you, David. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, so, so Paul, you've got pictures on your computer. Do you know how? Right. So, at the bottom yeah, of the Zoom, bottom, bottom, oh, bottom left, you've got share screen. Now, I will now turn it on so all panelists can share. So you now should be able to share screen. Share screen and screen one. Okay, guys, uh, as you can see, I'm not on my own. It's not just me. It's not just me and Paul. It's not just me and my top. It's, it's four of us. So I don't know if there's any need to introduce us, really, but there's me, David Sparky Ninja. There's my dad, Phil Watts, Mr. Paul Mead and E5. And I, I think, uh, God, Paul, um, have you done I'm many new. things on CAM? Have you done many things on no, webinars no, really. or podcasts? I'm, I'm the newbie. Wow. Great. Well, hopefully, yeah. This is a uh, Mr. Paul Skirm is obviously um, someone who we we uh, we treasure in E5 and in our in our little uh, rooms of clever people. And we're going to get him on to do a lot more of this. And um, you'll just listen to him, and you'll kind of understand. Um, and he's a guy that you do need to listen to. You know, <clears throat> um, you listen to him, then you'll move on. Right. Um, I'm not in control of this. <laughs> Mr. Skirm's in control of these images. But a similar format. There's a similar format to before. Now, I do have the polls that we run before in the two previous webinars. So if we did fancy doing a poll, I can always pop up a poll um, and we can see that how that goes, you know, just to see what the general opinion is. Um, anything you guys want to say about... I mean, let's do you want to just a couple minutes about coding in general? I mean, what's your, what's your opinion on um, the, the standard of coding right now? Well, I think we've got the codes where we can relate directly to BS7671. And I think if we're coding something, we should always be able to put a regulation number against it. And we should always include that in the ACR. You know, if you can't put the regulation number in the ACR with your code against your observation, you shouldn't be coding it. And uh, there are the other ones then where you think, mm -hmm. There's something wrong, it needs to be coded, and you need to think a little bit outside the box, depending on what the environment is, because something you might code in a domestic as kind of okay, you might code perhaps on a railway pole as totally unacceptable. And yeah. obviously the converse may also be true. I think one of the key things with coding is, is the at the end of the day, the code, the code is in the eye of the inspector, it always has been. And we all know our trade um, loves a good row now and again. Um, and coding is one of them things to row upon. Um, for me, coding is, is about explaining your engineering logic, your judgment. Um, and, and for me, the favorite type of coding is when you can narrate that logic. Okay, when I was growing up doing coding, I wasn't putting reg numbers when I first started doing it. Um, mm. But what I was doing was being challenged on why I coded. So I yeah. ended up having to go to the yellow book brown whatever color it was at the time and and read and do the work and understand the context of why i was arguing it and then you ended up almost memorizing and learning verbatim which is why i've always said there's certain regulations that are just constantly being breached um, and you yeah. end up just committing them to memory um, they're the ones that they're the ones that aren't very helpful because a lot of inspectors and and if i can just start off saying an inconvenient truth there's a lot of inspectors that are employed and told, I don't want to fail. I don't want mm. an unsatisfactory certificate. And that kind of contributes to the race to the bottom because it immediately is asking via financial gain to contribute <coughs> towards a, an, an incorrect outcome. 
of an inspection of the installation and that that's a major problem i think in coding and, and i don't we can't solve it tonight but i think it'd be cool to just go through our engineering logic and our judgment and see if we can all agree i mean i did an eacr once and the client said that to me and i went well i can't do it he said no no no, no you misunderstand if you find the code and it's codable it means the eacr is going to be unacceptable i want you to come back to me and i want you to talk talk to me about putting it right there and then I don't want an unsatisfactory because I want the remedials done as you go along. Mm. Ooh, that's thought, like a wow. that's like a blank check. That's fantastic. Well, no, because we had to every remedial we had to go back to them with and say what was needed, and we had to get a, a purchase order for. Yeah, but so, if the client's asking for that, that that's not that's not unreasonable to justify. This is unsafe. By the way, I can fix it. Here's a cost to do it, and this is all the logic behind it. Your cost should reflect that. So that's not a bad thing. No, I don't think different. you get that in domestic a lot, but um, it's fantastic. And that was a commercial. That yeah. was a commercial. Well, commercial. <laughs> did um, yeah. you know? We, we did a. I found. I, I found that like um, when I started obviously doing um, periodic inspections as they were called back then, and I was a qualified supervisor at a local authority, and the standard that was coming in for me to like look at was so um, short-handed. There's not enough detail, and it was, and it was because I wanted more detail to understand the what was being reported that I started myself to put the regulation numbers down. That extra amount of work, and it was when I started to do that that I then, when I started doing training in the seven six seven one area, that I started to realise if you fully unlocked your understanding of seven six seven one, then then coding becomes much more of an ease. Uh, but as you say, Paul, there are so many scenarios where someone can see what's in front of them, they know it's not right. But they can't quite pick out where in BS seven one specifically they should go to to get a direct, you know, codable. Well, to get a direct reference <clears throat> that results in that. And again, it stems down to the lack of uh, understanding on seven six seven one in general. I think. But that's part of the fun of the journey. And if if we can, but just before we get into the photos, if we can start off talking about the elephant in the room. Um, a lot of recently on social media, a lot of people have been highlighting and raising the issue of these this new. Uh, legislation that's come out for social housing and these unscrupulous um, landlords and uh, you know rental um, agents asking sparks <coughs> for like 70 pound 100 pound eicrs yeah. treating it like they're gas when yeah, it's di not dictating the price and and a decent eicr on a domestic home to be i wouldn't get out of bed for at least 350 quid to be perfectly mm. frank because you've got to go and do the work the the trouble is is what what could happen and what we are seeing is that uh, unscrupulous sparks because they're being offered large numbers in volume they're being told well you can make money out of them because you just limit everything other than go and get a board schedule get a zs at the tails and a fault current sit in the van and do the rest and you won't lose money and that's what's starting mm. to happen this is what we're seeing now which which is not great but it's the way I, when i was when i was fully on the tools towards the end of my time on tools that's where i got to if i got asked to a three four bed house all i really want is the freedom to spend the time there. So I want my day's money in my price. My price was my day's money. And then I haven't got to worry about, oh, I've got to get this knocked out by noon. i got to get this knocked out because it's only half a day's money. If the day's money was in the work, then, you know, it's like, you know, we, we, we joke about day rates, but you then put the time in with your inspection, you know, uh, and that's how I got to. Uh, but yeah, you know, you get outpriced um, because uh, many people will rush it through. <clears throat> Well, I had this discussion on the other day, actually. I was uh, at my father's house. Uh, he's just gone into a care home. We're looking to sell it. And we had an estate agent around to do some pricing. And we were discussing this very issue. And um, one of the big problems is that estate agents and land uh, tenancy agencies and whatever don't really understand electrics. And they don't really know what to expect. And when I explained to him that uh, if you are relying on a, somebody doing a two-hour visit to do a, a, a test and inspection on a installation as it's like taking your car down to the MOT service station and the, the mechanic just goes around and kicks all four tires and says, yeah, that's fine. Off you go. Now, would you be really happy about getting your wife and your kids in there and you, and you and going off on holiday, knowing that the inspection of the safety of your vehicle has just been uh, approved by somebody just kicking the four tires and saying, "Yeah, it's got four wheels. Off you go. That looks okay to me." And we wouldn't, we wouldn't do it if it was a car. We wouldn't do it. So why the hell do we want to do it for electrical installations where 
we got fires occurring, electrical shocks occurring, people are getting killed. Uh, it just it beggars belief to me that anybody would be happy with this nonsense of a, of a two-hour inspection and test. Yeah, the mm. trouble is, if, uh, if you don't mind me saying, I think it's complacency. For decades, people have advertised and said it's illegal to do gas work, it's illegal to do this, it's a, you know, uh, and, and yeah, you're right, people would never <clears throat> dare put their wife and kids in a car without a full MOT and making sure it's serviced or anything like that. But with electrics, there is this culture nationally of, if you, if you plug it in, it works, it's fine. It's always yeah. been that way. How many sparks have gone around and done that? I've been into loads of houses, death traps, but it's always worked. What's your problem? Oh, well, as, we all know, yeah, as we all know, any idiot can make electrics work, but it's just, it's, you know, it takes somebody who knows what they're doing to make it safe Indeed. and functional. So, yeah, this is the issue. Mm. Just right. about posts popping up on the social media recently with price lists from the customers dictating how much they're prepared to pay for work. So, yeah. does that mean we can walk into Tesco's or Asda or, or PC World or carpet right and say this is my this is how much i'm prepared to pay for a carpet i want that carpet i'm going to pay that much for it mm. isn't it the same scenario or i want that bottle of milk you want one pounds 30 for it no no i'm only prepared to pay 50p so i want it for 50p isn't it the same thing <laughs> you know we don't good, walk into retailers and demand the price yeah. Paul, there's a good comment on the chat about don't not lowering your standards your day rates your day rate and i think that's the only way that conscientious electricians can keep that I think there's a lot that the industry bodies need to do. Um, we know that because we've had them discussions with them um, and there's a lot more discussions that need to be had to get them to do more to, um, you know, making sure that tenants aren't saying, well, my mate down the road can give you 10 quid or 20 quid and all that. We just got to keep to our standards and keep to our wits really. But yeah, should there was, we push um, on? yeah we'll put the last quit for me on that is, you know, we watched the NIC live just this week and, uh, they were asked about these drive-bys, sixty pounds, etc., and they basically expressed that they put a lot of work into educating landlords um, about the dangers and stuff. But I, I don't feel that we've actually seen that response from these associations. We've not, nope. you know. I mean, I, I went. I mean, Phil mentioned about an you know estate agents. There's the association of these for the estate agents. Arla, there's, you know, there's nothing mentioned on there about this new legislation about new electrical safety considerations. They're just uneducated about the dangers of electrical safety. So without, without Dave, if without, they did with, it, we would see yeah, guidance out. We would we see would. the effects. Without, without assuming, I can only anticipate they're probably going around saying you need to use our badge, you know, our badged contractors, and that's probably the argument they're making, not about the broader uh, requirements of ensuring they, you know, they pay the right amount of money for this work to be done properly. Yeah, more than likely. Mm. Right. Uh, okay. So, what are we looking at here? <laughs> well, for the newbies, should we go through the codes, um, or are we assuming everybody here knows the C one, C two, what they are? Well, yeah. I mean, you go through. We can go through them. Um, so, so, I've got to shoot out for a second. I'll be back now. Just give me just a second. Oh, anyway. Do your thing. Sorry. God bless Paul and technology. Not realizing this is all live. <laughs> yeah, <it's not> <laughs> Yeah, his, his share screen's still up. If his share screen goes, then I'll be great going to. I just hope it doesn't become pictures. holiday photos or something else. Yeah. Um, all right. So those who may... <laughs> <laughs> all right. So those who may not be familiar with the codes, we have um, four types of code, or would you say three plus FI? I don't know. Um, so we have obviously C one, which is where there's an immediate danger or danger presence, um, which we see, uh, in fact, a good example is the, uh, the code break, which uses uh, like a traffic light system. Yeah, red, amber, green well, is a great Red, way. amber, green, it's a great yeah. way to do it. It's a great way to show your clients as well. Well, clients uh, understand that. Um, red, yeah. amber, green is a traffic light system. It's got a little traffic clients. light system in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. so C1, there's danger presence. Um, yep. Obviously, that's uh, dangerous. C2 is there's a potential danger. Now, few of us interpret that in different ways. Uh, my, my mental way of, of, of interpreting that is, you know, one action has to take place for danger to now be present. Um, so that's amber, so it's potentially dangerous. Now, both of those codes do result in unsatisfactory observations. Uh, that includes unsatisfactory dangerous under fault, doesn't it? Yeah. C2 would include dangerous under fault. So for instance, they say, if you haven't got a CPC on a circuit, um, it hasn't actually a C1 because it's not immediately dangerous. It's only dangerous if there's a fault. 
The yeah, latent same. defect, I think. I, yeah. I like to use the term latent defect. Yeah. So that's the guidance in Guidance Note 3. Um, mm. yeah. yeah. And um, so C1, C2, and C3 is improvement recommended, um, which basically doesn't technically mean non compliant with BS767, like the old C4 anymore. It just means that things could be better. Um, I think it covers a wide brush of stuff, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, really? it does. It does. Um, and what you need to do is determine if that improvement that is recommended is if that improvement that is, you know, not a potential danger or not going to, over the period of time between subsequent periodic inspections, potentially create a danger. Yeah. It used to be used to be widely used when like when we changed from the sixteenth edition to the seventeenth edition. Uh, it used yeah. to be widely used on issues that had been brought up by the seventeenth edition, like the introduction of RCD protection. Uh, which wasn't there under the 16th edition, and it yeah. was widely used in those days as, okay, well, it doesn't comply with the current edition of the regs, but doesn't necessarily mean that your circuit is dangerous. Mm. Yeah. Um, FI, I had, a, I, had a, I had a guy message me on Facebook about FI, actually, just two days ago. He's on a 2391, and his tutor is adamant that FI still is a satisfactory, potentially. Um, oh, really? He said that sitting guilds say that, and I said, well, you know, well, you know, Give me his details, and then I'll go to Peter Tanner or similar thing else, and we'll, we'll figure this out. Uh, but FI is further investigation, um, and if this FI is potentially an investigation that would result in the discovery of a C2 or a C1 observation, which you may not, you know, it's hard for you to determine that, um, depending on what the FI or the need for further investigation is, then that also warrants an unsatisfactory observation. Um, but yeah, C1, C2, C3, and FI. Now, We've further seen investigation, of... the FI, I mean, I, I think they sort of add on to that. Further investigation should be taken out um, urgently, not yeah, you know, without, in six months' time delay, or a I year's think. time. Yeah, it says without delay, I believe, was yeah. the wording. There. So, yeah. so if, you, if you are feeling that something needs to be further investigated and it needs to be further investigated without delay, then obviously you've got an issue. You've got a nasty fighter sense feeling there's something wrong. So there's no way at all that that can be satisfactory. I think a perfect example would be if I was going to do someone's house and um, I opened up one of the switches and I could see, you know, burnt out terminals, for instance, on a kitchen lighting circuit. And I've got, say, 20 old halogen lights. Now, I'm, I'm restricted by the time and the cost of my EICR. So you may actually turn around and say, well, listen, um, I've got some concerns. I've taken down one of the halogens and it's too close near a joist, I can see some evidence of burning, I recommend far more or scorching or damage to the joists, I recommend more investigations needed on that circuit, but as it stands, I can't pass it, which is why it's um, non-satisfactory, um, but it gives the spark at least a chance to discharge that duty to say, look, we need further investigation here, there's something wrong, it could be a little bit more, it could be a lot more. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of, I've always looked at FI as, and, and again, I, I, you know me, I use a slightly different set of language. Yeah. Um, that duty of care. To so, me, FI is duty of care discharged. So let's say that I've done an EICR for a factory, yeah. for a commercial property, and yeah. I've given the report unsatisfactory um, because of FIs. Yeah. Maybe just because of FIs. And the further investigation is maybe with regards to limitation or time, not ready, not can't be done. So moves on where does that sit the client having had an observation carried out have been told that you know technically these observations haven't been discovered they haven't been investigated where, where does that document stay at that point i mean it's well, not satisfactory is, so where is, is it well, this is one of the biggest problems that exists in the industry is how we discharge that duty now a lot of people who are registered with competent person schemes they have and i don't know where it is because i had it here a minute ago the danger notification forms hmm. um any any icr that is issued in some form or another, whether it be an email or whatever, there should be a, a, a level of duty discharge to that client to say, this isn't over. Um, normally, that you know, if it's a domestic homeowner, here's a danger notification. I, I have to give you to ensure that you know, I stay out of prison in six months. Heaven forbid, touch wood, anything could happen. And you're not yeah. trying to scaremonger. You're just being diligent. You want more time. You don't want to be seen to be, you know, um, taking money from vulnerable people and all that good stuff. I'm, listen, when I was on the tools, I used to work so many long hours. It was ridiculous for free just because I didn't want to leave people's houses dangerous. But I understand it's, it's a far more difficult well, again, world now. 
a lot of people are uh, they're told how long their reports will take before they've even arrived you know because of you know companies who send out inspectors will say you've got one this morning one this afternoon and so a lot of guys have to wrap up investigations with lots of FIs so yeah, that that's that's a, that's a that's a, just a road to nowhere isn't mm. it really that's a it's it's a bad business model it's an unethical business model and the trouble is is all it does is is it imports and this is the dumb thing the people that own these businesses that say go and do four a day if they actually realized how much risk they owned by saying well this engineer has gone out and done 12 this week but we have to wait three to four weeks to get the reports turned around before mm. we understand the extent of the the danger that we may have disturbed even greater now it's a you're almost dining on that chance of it'll never happen to me that when you've gone in and you've disturbed something that could be dangerous that it ends up becoming worse and causes a fire or an incident have you discharged your duty of care no mm. this is why i always say to people if you've got like uh, online ipads or electroform or whatever you use the minute you leave you sit in that van for another 20 minutes you do all the bits you need you send an email mm. and says see attached sadly it's failed um, I recommend the following under this, the, 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 under this law, under this legislation, I, and always end it with, I hereby discharge my duty of care to have taken reasonable steps to inform you of potential danger. See, you know? I, I think, I think um, either they, uh, you know, they, they adapt the model forms in, in uh, 60364 uh, or down to 7601, but if you have an AICR and you're achieving an unsatisfactory result, I think that I think that the standard procedure, not because a company like uh, Napit can make a pad, but we should have to have a standard model notice that goes on the front, a danger notice. So if you're yeah. completing the ICR with an unsatisfactory due to any C1, C2s or a single FI, then before you sign that off and say next inspection in 10 years, which obviously the little print will say subject to these observations being finished, there should be on the front something that actually harnesses the report for the client to go oh i need to i need to that's not what i wanted in fairness Dave, when i was doing them i found that 7671 was so inadequate for what i was doing mm. um i ended up making my own i mean when i was doing it a lot of my stuff was 110 volt center tapped you know i had two l1s so my, my r1 r2 was times two because i had two phase conductor circuits it was 55 volt i had no certificate that would do that so i had to go and create my own working from the regs and in yeah. doing that i actually understood more because i was putting more applied thought into how do i actually understand the behavior and characteristics of the circuit so that i can test and record it properly lo and behold once we did start doing it we found most of them had failed and then it looked we looked at the design and the designer had never considered the safety performance of that circuit mm. yeah Scary okay stuff. um let's 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 look at some of these images then shall we that have been sent in so yeah, well we've got a bg board here yeah uh, and clearly, the person who's terminated that has used the wrong tool. I'm not a fan of them ferrules either. Them link ferrules, they're awful. Not a fan yeah, of them. most of the manufacturers seem to use those um, reducing pin type ferrules, though. Yeah. They do, don't they? They kind of distort yeah. in the in the connection. I like the solid bars one. I like the solid bar ones myself. I get you get a lot of left right movement, don't you, with those? Mm. If, if they're fitted properly. They were a real get out of jail card because you can go down from, you know, from sixteen to ten, from ten to six, mm, from from twenty five yeah. to sixteen, and and thirty five to twenty five and stuff for terminals. But yeah. they've got to be fitted properly. You've got to use. What I like about it's one of the redeeming features of the chint board. I think it's one of the only redeeming features of the chint board. But um, they've got solid link bars and they are absolutely solid. Really, I think they're yeah. a really good feature. But what would you say? I, I'm going to go straight off. If I walked into a house and the cover was off, it's a C1 all day long. Off, it, cover off C1. Yeah. Cover, cover off C1, yeah. Where it is now, um, again, my eyesight being rubbish. Um, Paul, can you zoom in on that? Is there any damage to any of the copper? Uh, I can. Just give me a sec. Yeah. Lost my mouse. i got so many monitors on the go, yeah? Sorry. <laughs> so I've got four on the go myself. Yeah, I'm using one. All right, so... There doesn't look to be any damage down on the oh. bottom of the live where it goes into the to, to the switch. Looks like come? one of the neutral strands is broken, or something. There's something up there, Phil. There. Yeah, I yeah. tend to agree. There's something. Yeah. At right. the top there. That mm -hmm. doesn't look right there, does it? No, that looks no, as if it's snapped. There's definitely a nick in the one of the neutrals where the knife has hit it. There. The nick so in that one, the and the one to its left looks as if it's snapped. Yeah, that does look like a snap. I'll agree with you there as well. 
Um, we obviously we're getting to the limit of the resolution of the picture now. Yeah, I was going to say, so um, <laughs> nice <and neat. laughs> you know, we can go up here. Oh, got okay. glasses out now. Oh yeah, C2. my glasses are going on. Yeah. So, what yeah. does everyone online think? Everyone, one person well, said a C two. I think I've seen a C two. Um, but yeah, Chris, Chris Beanie going with a C two. Um, yeah. uh, Adrian, Adam, sorry, Ben C two. Yeah. yeah. Um, Simon C two. Andy Dunn C two. Matt right. Ralph C two. C two. Peter Sewell C two. Yeah. I think this yeah. is this is a this yeah. is a this this image is a typical C two. I mean, as as long as as you say that you've removed an enclosure to observe that, you know, totally. If you've walked is... in and there's no cover on that board, I mean, yeah, it's C one all day. But if the rest of the board is integrity is okay, everything is fine. You take the board off to check the connection. You see that, then you know, for me, it'd be a C two. Mm. Okay, so it's, so here's a here's a question with this. I mean, what, what if you were there and let's say this is a domestic it's gonna be unsatisfactory is it upon you is it is it upon your um commitment to now replace these tails or price I, it i probably it's not immediately dangerous enough, it's behind an enclosure if there was enough length on it i'd just say do you mind me knocking the power off love and just restrip them and retarten them up um yeah. a five minute little job um i'll be honest with you if that was me and i was doing that as a paying job i wouldn't do it you price it up? Really? No, I wouldn't do it. No. I'm not being paid to do it. I've got to make a living. I'd report right. it. I'd discharge it. You, you care. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the job there and then. No, yeah. I'm a bit of a soft touch, Paul. You know that. That's why we need Paul. Yeah, That's job, why we need Mr. Skirm or more of these. The other shoulder. The other, yeah, 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 the yeah, other yeah. shoulder. It's like the if, evil Paul. <laughs> if it was an 80-year-old old deer on her own in the house, and you know? Yeah. I, but if it was a young, upwardly mobile couple... With two Mercedes in the drive, yeah, not that then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I'd agree with that. Yeah, in all fairness, um, if, or, a commercial, if... or a commercial premises, if there was a board yeah. of commercial premises, you ain't gonna, you ain't, you ain't never done for nothing, mate. No, no, I'm not in a commercial. I'm, I'm yeah. more thinking I would do it if it was more about protection of the home and the people within it. If it was a yeah. family, vulnerable you person, yeah. I'd do it. No, if no yeah, if you totally. If you've got maybe a client that was missold or someone's been a bit stupid, but I mean, David does raise a good point in the chat. If you're going to go and change it, you're going to have to isolate it. Now, assuming that that's not going into a double pole isolator, yep. it's going into a meter tail, and obviously the meter Ooh. fairies have revisited since the person here before and resealed it. What's the action? If, it's, if, it's, if you can't isolate it, you're stuck in here. And, uh, um, Jonathan's just put up in the chat, it's from a six-bed HMO, no isolator, head sealed. Oh, there we go. Okay. So it's commercial. It's HMO. It's a business. Yeah. So it's quoted. Come back when it's, uh, you know, yeah, come, yeah, back in, come back in another time and do it, innit? Yeah. Okie dokie. I think it's one of those, isn't it? That's mine, um, you know? <laughs> that's, yeah. me. that's me. That's me. That's what I would do. You know, you can't, you can't give everything away, can you? When you're trying to make a living out of it. No. 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 But it does depend, it's, it's on, it depends those, a lot if, on the background. If it was me, um, if that was the only thing that was wrong, and if I could easily sort it out, and it was an elderly lady, yeah, on her pension, I would do it. Yeah, I agree. But if if there's other things involved and it's a business, etc., then I would say because you know, at the end of the day, when we put a price in to do an EICR, a uh, periodic inspection report, uh, we price mm. on just doing the inspection test report. Yeah. We don't I remember price this... doing remedials, and for a lot of firms, it's the remedials that you make your money on. This could have been one of those landlords that told you last week you are far too expensive. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, it's always down to the background. But um, okay, uh, Paul, do you want to move on to another picture? Yeah, we can certainly. If I can find my mouse, here we go. Ooh, look at that! Oh, oh yes, oh, the old three eight seven one classics. Okay, um, this is one of Jonathan's pictures as well. Um, Jesus, John. <laughs> Oh, he's, he's had some crack. He's done, he's done a lot of HMOs recently. He's done some of my old sites that I've handed over to him um, because I've started doing more consultancy and stuff. Um, the, he's had some crackers recently. Love him. <laughs> I get around lol, he says. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so okay, so it's a, a board like that. Yeah, I'm a, well, was the lid off, Jono, or did you take the lid off? 
Well, lid off, it's a C2, C1 straight away, isn't it? I was going to say it's a C, I'd say that's a C1. C1 anyway. Lid on, yeah. lid on. Um, even if it's got the old little screw on cover over them. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go with a C1 because the little screw on cover had a thumb screw on it, didn't it? So yeah, the idea yeah. was that the householder could, under this cover, to change the fuses, to do whatever. So I think regardless, that's got to be a C1, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, C1, you've got to replace it. You do not have a push fit um, 3871 on the wagon. Just isolate it. I, I, in that case, looks like you've got there, looks like you've got them. three light circuits all in one way there. That could be someone's lighting. So what do we do if you haven't got a three eight seven one to replace that? What time is it? A oh, wicks open. <laughs> Sorry, I've got loads in the shed. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah. got on the shelf, but wicks wicks keep them on the shelf. I used to. But, um, but it's these little things, these little scenarios that'll make an electrician oh put those one mils over to that fifteen amp. You know. Yeah. In, in all fairness, though, one of the lessons learned for, I think, a lot of sparks is this is why keeping a, a collection of old breakers is essential, especially if you're jobbing, especially if you're doing domestic. I remember when I was driving around doing central eating and all sorts, I used to have a whole series of boxes of old breakers in that were just invaluable. If I ever found stuff that I could do quick fixes on and the immediately dangerous stuff when I when I was doing domestics, you just got on and fixed it, to be perfectly honest with you. That was what the culture I had and the people mm. I worked with had, we didn't, it does, it does. Worry. It's got on a bit. When it comes to things like the need to do remedials and things, it does stress that if you haven't got the right materials, which also means an understanding of what you may need to replace, you, you may fall short of being defined as a competent person with regards to prevent danger relative to the nature of the work. Yep. If the work is to maintain that system, if you, you know, so you, you may need to, when yes, you sir. do EICRs, try to get an understanding of what, gear there may need to be for you to replace so when you do a quote maybe get a picture of the board or something ahead yeah and take you can walk away from that though you, you can walk, walk away from it but if no. you haven't got the gear to fix it you're going to fall into a crack yeah, yeah. the guidance anyway the guidance in the in guidance note three and the guidance that's given generally when you're doing inspection and testing is if you come across a c1 which is immediately dangerous is that we should take action to remove that danger before we leave site and that mm -hmm. could be isolating the circuit as, as a minimum. You know, if it's a yeah. live cable hanging out the wall, we can we can take Fair it up enough. or do something with it. Yeah. You know, yeah. but we mustn't leave things that are immediately dangerous. And that is but, the guidance that's given. But if this is lighting, if we can't keep it in service, that might create a second danger. Yeah, I mean, what you said, I took the lid off and this fell apart with a lid uh, still in, uh, no, the lid still intact. So. I mean, so just just stick it. If he was, you know, if he if it was an odd situation, he'd be on the phone to me. We've yeah. got, he's got a key for my unit. In in this situation, I would say, no, Jonathan, he has a key to my lockup, but we have a range of these breakers on the shelf, and he'd have been within an hour of a return journey to my lockup at any time of day or night to pick up one of these. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think to have them on the van. That's why, to be honest, like because domestics, you don't tend to travel three, four, five hours away to do a domestic job, do you? No, depends, really. depends, mate. Do you want to see people go all sorts nowadays? Unless it's a favour for like... a family member or something yeah. just moved. Yeah, in which case you'd probably plan ahead, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know. And charge them double. <laughs> <laughs> oh. right. David, yeah. David says the um, the 30 amp bottom connection looks a bit overloaded. So, yeah, the 30 I amp cable in, looks... Zoom in if I can. Yeah, it looks a bit like it's swelling a little bit. Uh, don't forget, I think this is this along here. You can see my mouse case. Can you? Uh, that looks like that's a dust layer, dust, isn't it? That's a dust layer there. Yeah, yeah. classic. Um, so, not that I would uh, just want to ch chip into the debate here, but hmm. I've got a lovely book here, which is quite handy. I've and got straight one away, like that, right here. It's a great little book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but so. straight away, if you open it up to Regulation Five, it's Strength and Capability of Electrical Equipment. Which, looking at that has been massively compromised mm -hmm. straight away. So it doesn't have the strength and capability to um, withstand any external stresses. You then have to have, under Regulation 16, um, you have to be competent to prevent danger and injury. Uh, and uh, if you go back to Regulation 5, it says the defence regulation uh, applies. And the defence regulation is you have to take all reasonable right. steps um, five. to avoid committing offence. Yeah. Is 5 a reasonably practicable regulation or absolute? Uh, shall be. It's a shall. It's, it's a shall. shall. Yeah. So it's an it's absolute. Not reasonably practicable absolute. then. 
Yeah. No, oh, this is again. This this is yeah. This is saying that. That's why I use this book when I'm ever coding <laughs> anything. Just go straight yeah. to the AWR straight and it, it becomes bulletproof. Well, this is what we're going to do next, isn't it, Paul? We're going to look we and try to move next, yeah. forward into the AWR with these with these codes. Yeah, because uh, it makes it makes your report okay. so much stronger. It does. It, it it gives you the engineering logic, the argument to have discharged the duty of care correctly. Because mm. if let's put it like this, so. If I was asked by the IET to do some expert witness, or, or, or Paul was, um, and we had a number of cases that involved this sort of stuff, we would start with the legislation. You know, we would look at duty of care, we'd look at health and safety at work, we'd look at the AWR, and we'd go, right, well, okay, let's look at the photos of the installation where the incident took place. Well, straight away looking at that picture, I can see the strength, capability, and equipment was compromised via some means. The hmm. competent inspector, if he's walked away, has breached his duty of care. Right. If he if he then issued him a danger notification, the danger notification was clear and unambiguous. Great. No problem. He's taken reasonable steps. He has a defense. If he doesn't yeah. and he hasn't done that, he has none. And this this is something that Phil and I often talk about is the lack of time to be reporting with this work. Yeah. And so many guys nowadays are on the site with the laptop, auto filling, auto compiling a report that's sent digitally. And then they're in the van to the next job. There's no time to sit and actually absorb what you've what you've seen, what you've witnessed, and actually then relate that to legislation to compile you know a report. The system, the software is doing it all, and that's getting lost. And that's that's fine. This, the, these software tools are supposed to assist you in your engineering mm. duty of care being discharged, not do it for you. Yes, it's handy to have the code breaker stuff built into it, the, but there should be, and I'm a, I'm a big fan, and I'm, I'm sure Phil is as well, when I used to do stuff, you always had a little section where the inspector could just write his small novel, which was, uh, I've seen this, I'm not happy with that, this isn't good enough, la 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 la. And, yeah. and that, that is always that final engineering judgment of the inspector, because the inspector's judgment is key. But the inspector needs to remember, two, three years later, if there's an incident, he needs to be able to stand the court of law, having reread his document, and be able to say, yeah, I took all reasonable steps, because That's then, yeah, if he if he can't take if he can't say he took reasonable steps, then someone will sit across from him going, really, yeah, okay, right. So there's a big fine for this guy coming along, yeah. or worse. Jono, I'm exactly the same, buddy. I'm always taking pictures when I'm doing observations, when I'm doing investigations, yeah, because you know, and sometimes I'll, I'll sit down and I'll see things I didn't see when I was on site as well. Do you know, oh, can I can I? Can I deviate slightly from this Go one into a machinery one, right? I did a, a safety inspection of a factory, and I took about a 1,000 pictures of this factory. Instead of writing notes, I just take pictures, right? Yep. So I got back to the office, and I sat down, going through my pictures, and I went, oh, my flipping goodness. And I emailed the client straight away because one of his sparks had bypassed the safety relay on an emergency stop system. Jesus. So if you hit the emergency stop, the machine wouldn't have shut down now yeah. if i hadn't taken those pictures and gone back to the office and sat down and reviewed them i wouldn't have spotted that because i didn't spot it on site if i'd have had to do that report there and then in the van in the car whatever i wouldn't have spotted that mm. i know it's slightly off topic but i think the sentiment is the same oh completely well it does say doesn't it on the certification when you do an eicr it says it's been tested on such and such a date and reviewed on another day um and really what should be happening is that yes we can do the inspection and test and we can start completing the form but we should sit down and go all the way through it and just take another view at it when we've completed it and just make sure we're happy with what we've done and the other thing is that you know we're always saying this is that we're the things we're looking at at the moment is all inspection items it's not tests and far too much emphasis is on filling in the forms getting figures and ticks and whatever in the boxes so we can complete the paperwork and then just pass it off and say everything's okay. 85% of the problems we find are by inspection. Inspection and testing or inspection mm. supplemented by suitable and sufficient testing. Yeah. yeah. Now we picked this up the other day because it actually says inspection and where relevant testing. Yeah. Some, yeah. Somewhere in this book it says testing is where relevant it says yeah. that in the PAT testing code as well. We must inspect and where relevant, test. Testing is to support our inspection. There's a very yeah. good comment in the um, chat about using a voice recorder as well to note thoughts yeah. from Chris. Bang on. Yeah. Yeah. Notation. Yeah. 
Perfect. Yeah, I have one. I've tried that. Yeah, I even actually bought some auto dictation software that takes my voice recordings and turns it into a, a Word document for me. Oh wow! Uh, yeah. Does yeah. it understand you? <laughs> Does it understand Welsh? <laughs> oh, do boy! Oh, a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, we can't do subtitles live, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. What's okay. this then? Oh, we haven't done many pictures. Look, this is like. I think this is another one of Jonathan's, actually. This is a downlight by the look of it, with a hole in the ceiling around it. Now, I'm going to guess, he's not mine. Oh, not mine, he said. Um, one so I guess this is one of Dempsey's then, I guess. Mr. I think Dempsey's. this is one of Ryan's, yeah. So is we've got a cable there. coming through? Is that a cable oh. coming through next to the light? It looks that way. Mm, I, still, yes. I, mean, I can zoom in, guys, but I don't think we're going to get much. Genius. There's something going through there, isn't there? That looks like a cable to me. I reckon yeah. somebody's fed the downlight from somewhere else into the, rather than go across through the through the void, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Ben's asking, is that a cable? I mean, Chris is, Chris Beanie's gone C two, and I think. <sighs> yeah, downlight. That looks like a halogen yeah. or a or a incandescent Jeez. downlight. It looks incandescent. It doesn't look like it's some kind of low heat light. It looks like it's quite a warm one. I mean, yeah. what I would do here, I'm immediately going to fi that. I want to investigate. Oh, if there's damage now to that cable, yeah, to then decide That's... what my level of what my code level is. If I'm C2 yeah. or I'm hitting C1 already, yeah, yeah, I'd FI. I think you're right. I think C2 or an FI for there. Mm. Um, should we move on so I get a couple of these done? Because I'm gonna, gonna play really devil's advocate on that one. Go on, now. and I'm gonna throw C1 into it just straight oh, away. Then. C1 is that light fitting, and I'll tell you why. Why can you go back to that light fitting, Paul? I can certainly, Phil. Okay. Right, what happens if it's a fire? Yeah, now, mm -hmm. with it being one of Ryan's, I didn't bring this up, but that would, could well be an HMO, or it could be a flat, that could well be a fire compartment. Or a, not sure if I... That, that smoke smoke and fire's going to go straight through that. Yeah. 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 So I, yeah. I, know, I know you could say, well, it's a C2, because it's only dangerous in, in the case of... In a fire. But there's so many, so many ad additional factors there. The fact that, yes, the cable could catch fire because of the heat of the lamp, the cable could get damaged by the actual serration or the edges of the light fitting, but also the fact that you've now basically destroyed the fire compartmentation, so you've now got the spread of smoke and flame mm. in the event of a fire. I would actually raise that from a C2 to a C1, purely on my own risk assessment, and I would then back that up with a report attached to the certificate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't argue yeah. with that. Yeah, and there's probably some C3s judgment. with regards to the luminaire not being fitted properly or some other nonsense. But yeah, you yeah. Pre you're pretty much you pretty much you pretty much got it fixed by that point. How do you how do you go along? You know, I mean, I can remember I did an expert witness job on a on a house on a, a multi million pound house if you guys remember, and oh, yeah. we decided in the end we were only going to put the highest codes down. We yeah. Gonna, if it was a C1, a C2, and a C3, we only went for the C1. Yeah. Because otherwise, it just gets too complicated. Well, completely. If you've got one a scenario and there are C1, C2, and C3, you've got to start with the main risk. Mm. And then if that's remedied, if the other risks are not remedied in the process, you bring them yeah. up. I know yeah. where that one is. It doesn't look like that anymore. It's my daughter's house. <laughs> oh, oh, right. was, was my daughter. It is my daughter's house, but it, used, and it doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> um, I mean, okay, we've got its uh, incoming copper water. Yep. There. Bond is there. It has been scraped back. Um, I think it's connected the other end. I didn't actually take this one. Jonathan, because my daughter was buying the house, I refused to do the EICR on the property myself in case the vendors decided they were going to come up with some, you know, excuse that, you know, daddy mm -hmm. is uh, yeah. saying things that he shouldn't. Um uh, no, Chris, thermal damage. No, no thermal damage, mate. Everything was fine with the cable. Um, it's probably a little bit over 600 from there to there. Mm -hmm. um, it was a good connection. Well, is the, is the, how, how much is that cable vulnerable to movement uh, or vibration? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a house, so it should, we don't get many earthquakes, do we? Mm -hmm. Um this is a void for this was a connection for a washing machine which wasn't there. Uh, so it's gonna be there's gonna be an appliance right in front of it. There would normally be an appliance right in front okay. of it. Yeah. So but now then you say about vibration, Dave, that would be the water connection to the appliance. Now an appliance would vibrate. 
Yeah. Yep. Oh, Chris, sorry, Chris, you said thermal damage. That was the um, downlight. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you had the possibility of, of vibration coming into that copper pipe and, and vibrating that that conductor because there's no clips on it, and it actually goes further off the picture that you can't see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would. I, I think we did a C three on that one because it was there. It had a good connection. It was better than nothing. It was outside the six hundred, and it wasn't clipped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's that's it. it. I mean, it could be it could be improved. You could have yeah. much more better mechanical uh, mechanical fixings. Yeah. Uh, its size is fine with regards to mechanical protection. It just could do more fixings to protect it from protect the connection from any vibration and things. Is that actually yeah. the incoming water service? It is one of the incoming waters to the prop. One of the incoming waters to the property. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> if you look here. There's uh, another one which goes there through the wall, and there's a, oh, you can't actually see them, but here, there's some microbore, the very, very bottom right hand corner of the, pro of the picture, there's yeah. a couple of microbores that go under the screed. Mm. So, uh, obviously, their classes in come in, they're, they're extraneous conductive parts as well, because they go under the screed, you know? All right, so da David's brought up the question of, is it lugged or just rammed in, which uh, Jono said it's in. rammed in. So, yeah. I mean... Are we okay with it being rammed in or split around the no. screw, or do we want it? Would we escalate like that to say it could be lugged? No. Well, it should calls, be lugged. Calls, again, calls, we, his don't opinion, lugged or rammed in. We're talking about a C3, aren't we? You know, the connection yeah. was there. It was sound as far as it should be. Yeah, it should be lugged, Chris. I agree. Um, yeah, it should be. <laughs> just, to see, just, to see, just to see C3, you know, if it's evidently still tight and stuff. Just yeah, to it C3, was, I think. Okay. Um, as I say, to be fair, Jonathan did this one for me because I didn't want to get into any any mm. uh, arguments with the house vendor. Cool. Um, oh. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. We have a big, tush up, a big hole up here. We have a big hole here. Lots of exposed copper. No support for these connections. Um, okay, there's so a few things to talk about with this one. Um, First of all, what is it? Is it is it like a shower supply that's been ditched or something? I'm not sure who's this or one is again. That looks like someone's attempt to joint a cable at some point um, using yeah. whatever box they yeah. had on the back of the van, but not a chance. That looks like at least a six mil and straight away. Well, it's a stranded. Yeah, it's, it's a stranded earth. That's awful. So a so a stranded earth's got to be a ten, surely, because it's going to be four mil. A six mm. mil is a two point five solid in a CP in a. Twin, isn't it? Twin and Earth, yeah, I think Normally so. I'd agree oh. with you, but most manufacturers, I was looking at an armoured uh, the other day and the difference inside, they were the same size conductors, but when you look at the outer diameter of the cables, so you would think they were two different sizes completely. Right. Yeah. Jono says here, it's a oh, uh, on, HMO, it's a junction box for a shower supply in use, it's 10 mil. Jesus. Yeah, right. That's pretty, I mean, <laughs> when you look at the, 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 the gaps that you've got around the entries to this, um, I'm mm. guessing when he took the lid off that, the um, the connection wasn't secured. I would have guessed that the earths were connected. I'm hoping the earths were connected, Jonathan. Floating sequences, yeah. Let's see if Jonathan comes back and says, yeah. Peter Sewell has said, if the earth conductor hasn't been connected, see one all day. Whoa. Go on, you then. need a fault. You need a fault for a, for the absence of an earth conductor to be dangerous. Exactly. So that's a C2 so, for me. So C2, um, if it's a domestic shower, it'd be a C2 for me. Now, there are some environments, I've been working on some very, very much lately, where there's lots of protected conductor currents floating around. So the essential uh, presence of continuity of your protected conductors is much more important, but that's not domestic reach. That's more no, the rail totally, and areas like totally. that where I've been. And that's where we'd be going from the C2 to the C1, where yeah. the absence of that in normal use in fault-free conditions can still result in some exposure to current. Yeah. Um, it's um, my, my view on that. Um, cable into the wall isn't fire sealed, and it's a fire compartment. Matt Ralph said bending radius here. Yeah, and I agree with that as well. Mm. What, size, sir, what was the size of the uh, protective device? 30 amp, Jonathan says, as he remembers. Okay. We should have had him, rate, shouldn't we? The rating of the <laughs> connector block. Uh, rating of the connector uh, block itself. Oh, it was a 40 amp device. The I think you said 40, yeah. 40 amp. Yeah. Right. I think uh, I'd like to know what the rating of the connector block is. Yeah. Yeah. I think for yeah, me, this I is. I agree, Phil. Because if that was a 20 C2. amp connector, it's a C2. 
Yeah. It was a 40 amp connector. You know, then we wouldn't really worry, would we? About the, we wouldn't. About that specific part. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me ask you a question, Paul, because you've obviously got a bit of background machinery and all this other stuff. When we have cables that are live conductors, carrying current that are floating in connections, what would you what would you do? Would you just go to five two six, or would you do anything else? Because obviously five two six would stress the need for mechanical and electrical continuity of our connections. If Is there anything else you would go to? A chalk block connector in a panel of a machine or something. Just something floating around, yeah. No, no, it's, it's the same same request B761. It's got to be fixed. If you've got, yeah. why, like, if this was on a bigger scale and that connector was floating inside a machine panel, which was two meters by two meters, and there was a load of other stuff in there, and you've got a connector like this hanging in the front of it, yeah, that, that's, that's unacceptable under the machinery right. requirements as well. Okay, that's interesting. Cool. Um, so if you um, see, like, a consumer unit and someone's put a connector block in there just floating in the back, same, same, same principle, yeah. Well, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mechanical and electrical support. Oh, me, uh, so mechanical. No connections must not be any mechanical strain. I think. Or something yeah. Like that. Good, I think, yeah. I'm five two six point one. I'm seeing a lot of people obviously because we have a lot of because a lot of people now are wiring homes with feeds to light switches. Yeah. Now I think Hager and a couple of others have light switches now with a neutral terminal in them. But a lot yeah. of people are floating their neutrals. Yeah, I don't now, agree with might, that at all. They might use Wago connections or something similar, but obviously, you know, we're going to start seeing these observations a lot more in the future where we've yeah. got live conductors in the back of switches and they're just floating in the back. Dave, I think this is where the installation methods and the regulations are slightly parting. Um, mm. Because again, any, any connection which can be put on undue strain from, i.e. that picture there, undue bending radius, uh, there could be external influences like vibration, etc. Um, and the regulations are very, very clear. It's uh, the strands of conductors shouldn't be any strain on them on the terminations. They should be fixed. This is all in the wiring rigs. I, yeah. I have never for the life of me, even when I was learning as an electrician, when we started looking at, because everyone's going, oh yeah, two plate, two plate. Why then we were bringing stuff in and putting connector blocks in the back of switches. Uh, considering yeah. that these switches were 16 mil, 25 mil deep, not designed for any of this. Otherwise, those back boxes would have a place where you could take away go and fit it in so that it was secure. Fitting it from movement this is the thing. and all the rest of Ben's it. Ben's just mentioned it. What would you do if it's a Wago? Now, Wago or Vago, uh, connect Sorry, box. Sorry, Vago. Vago, oh, Vago. Yeah. Connect, connect box Vago, made, that, made, that, made the Vago, Vago box. Uh, but recently, they've obviously they've changed their profile, haven't they? They've gone to the 221s, these much smaller shaped profiles. So what Wagobox are now doing is they're providing these inserts with their boxes because to actually put a Wago into a Wago box, now to comply with the requirements of maintenance free, which means no risk of mechanical movement, you have to put these inserts with that. So just putting a loose Wago in a connector would not comply with uh, maintenance free or mechanical it's, Dave, it's vibrations five two six, in that sense. 526 electrical connections it even says and this is what what frustrates me with when you open up a dimmer and you see an army of connector blocks um 526.2 uh, the temperature attained at the terminals in normal service um as such that the effectiveness of the insulation and conductor temperature is not impaired the provision of adequate locking arrangements um, subject to vibration or thermal cycling <coughs> the number of conductors connect can, we are seeing pictures now on social media where people have got like four or five Strips neutrals them. and all sorts of stuff tucked in the back and you're like do Ooh. you know what holy wow mother of yeah okay oh that looks, that looks fun that looks familiar yeah. yeah i know i know i stuck that one in <laughs> <laughs> but no yeah i think, I I think, think we'll just have one last thing to that last picture sorry yeah. phil just have one yeah. last thing to that picture i'm gonna throw a c1 into that again and you that is because I'm going to throw a C1 in, and it's because it's a 40 amp circuit, and the connector blocks are rated at 30 amps. And unless, unless the shower is less than seven kilowatt, it's going to be pulling more than 30 amps all day. Yeah. So therefore, the connectors are not up to the purpose. Connectors are not, not rated, duty. absolutely. So as soon as the shower's on, those connectors are overrated, and there's a fire risk, immediate mm. fire risk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that makes sense. it takes. We, we, Dave and Paul and I went through this the other night when we were looking. When Dave was looking at some thermal imaging, and obviously yeah. it takes. A, it, there's a finite time for dual heating to occur, and the shower tends not to be uh, very long. 
If it was electric heating... You haven't met my daughter. <laughs> my son, don't don't the show for an hour today, I know, because he wasn't feeling too good. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it's a valid so point, actually, Paul. You are, you are using your engineering, ju engineering judgment based on a bloke jumping in a shower. Um, but um, I can tell you now, even my missus, the shower is like, it's an hour-long event. It's an event. It's not just <laughs> yeah. a thing. It's not in and out. It's an event. Yeah, but an hour, you know... You but it's the same... About... <clears throat> If you don't mind me saying, it's the same argument as to why we don't apply AFDDs, even though it's a high current using piece of kit, we're not using them sufficiently. It's it's in and out, on and off, mm. um, and normally we're there using it, um, which is why AFDD is prohibitively expensive on that sort of circuit. Mm. But Jono's just said a HMO port, uh, port shower could be on for long periods because you may have six people living there going through yeah, their shared shower yeah shared showers comment. and things yeah so, good point. this Valid does this point. does this does obviously uh, show that you need to look at the demand of equipment with yeah. your inspection it, it, it's yeah. uh, this this is where yes. the engineer judgment this is where knowledge of the installation this is where knowledge of the the, the potential failure modes and everything comes in you know yeah and this yeah. is where the inspect this is why <laughs> such an important part SCR, requires professional indemnity insurance because they're giving their professional opinion on something and if their pro professional opinion is proven wrong they're going to get sued and if they're mm -hmm. a sole trader they could lose their house if they haven't mm. got professional indemnity to fight it for them i was asked i was this is a slightly, slightly different area but i was i was doing some duty holder training of a, 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 a vegetable pickers last year and they asked me how much how look because i noticed some of the issues with their patch testing when i was there and they go do you do patch testing i said i could but it wouldn't go anywhere. And they, and they said, how, how would you do it? How much prior? I said, well, no, the first thing you need to do is you can see me walk around your site for about a day and a half doing nothing but watching. I said, what do you mean? And I just tried to explain. You're going to actually try to get an understanding on the use of the business, the use of the site, the way people behave. And when I said that, they went, okay, now that makes a lot of sense. You know, <laughs> but this is no time. This isn't quantified in work anymore. No. Yeah, it's not quantifiable. Now, what are we looking at here? C1. <laughs> Genius. C1, yeah, C1. Land boulder, terminal C1. Um, C2 for the connections on the... Uh, good God, the, what size are they? The, I don't know. the effort that must have got... They look like 240 singles, but the sheer effort that. that's gone into that is but, mind I mean, that, I mean there's, there's hours of graft in that to get that, that up. That enclosure has been installed just for the purpose of containing that. Is yes, that, right? yeah, that, that, that dodgy lesser. In all somebody's fairness, taken the end off and passed it through that enclosure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, in all fairness, I Let's worked when I when I was an apprentice, Dave. I worked in factories where you would have high level where they'd be manufacturing <laughs> plant, etc., and you would have high level buzz bar cranes and all sorts. And I knew that the guys, the guys who were working there, the local Sparks, if somebody said I need an extra socket, they'd go up in a cherry picker in an isolation, drill a hole in the buzz bar, eight thousand amp buzz bar, and they'd just literally drill and tap. 2.5 mil crimp screw down into a piece of conduit into a socket. That was what they were doing in factories. I, I have somewhere thousands of photos of these. Um, I need to dig them out because they mm. were priceless to see. People didn't think of overcurrent protection. It was just get it in, get it on, get it working. Did they, did they actually turn the buzz bars off or they drove and tap them live? No, they turned the buzz bars off oh, okay. to weekends and stuff. So oh, okay. I had a chat <laughs> of them before they all left permanently yeah. i'm turning my head slightly because pete said it looks like the neutral smaller and i think he might be right you know um i'm not gonna argue it, it's hard uh, is yes. that is that the triangle profile i don't I think it is Ooh, ah, no it could be couldn't it, it could be, a could be that conductor. that shape conductor it might be an angle on the shape mm -hmm. so I'm that's why i'm turning my head with it oh yeah, yeah. No, anyway. that's, a, that's not that's anyway not so um right i think this is one of ryan's is it i think I think so. Looks like yeah. it. Yeah. So if you don't well, mind, lads, I've got a couple I'd like to show as well, actually. All right. Well, do you want to do yours for a bit? Paul, yeah, I've got then, two. Uh... I've got two I'd like to show, which I think. Well, look. Quite, let, um, let's let's quickly go over this relevant. one. And what time we right, do? Let me just stop sharing. Then we'll jump to Paul. Put How do I share up. before I go? Bong? Oh, here we go. I got it. Got it. <laughs> All right. Go. Share screen. Stick to your screen. Oh, you've all. Can you see my screen now? Or... I see your yes. screen. Yeah, we've moved for you. You're fine. Um, you're oh, sh you're sharing it fine. But if you okay. can see, uh, you saw cool. you showed you you showed this earlier on. Now what are we? Looking oh, this at? is in the, this is in the folder. I put this in the folder actually. So this is this is found today. So this was yeah. found today. It's and, double pile. Um, 
And what I'd like, I, no, no, I want to open this up to the chat room now. So I want okay. the guys in the chat room to look at this and see this because this this really annoyed me because this was an this was an incident today. Um, and I just want you to look at it and and see the glaringly obvious. Um, it's a, I'm it's assuming a, it's, it's a, no way in no way related to your workplace, Paul. No, no way related no, no, to your no. workplace. No, no not something at all. else completely separate. Something yep. completely separate. I, I wasn't physically there doing stuff, no. getting annoyed at. No, absolutely, of course, mate. Um, but it's a free phase board. Yep. So if we if we maybe look at the connection details, and then the breaker type. Yep. The word bang in goes comes to mind as well. Hmm. So we've got a double pole RCBO. Mm hmm. Connected across three phase two board. phases. Across two phases. Is that correct? Ha ha. <laughs> so what's going to happen? The word bang come to Good mind. Grief. <laughs> yeah. Found it today. Not joking. Found it today. Seriously? Yep. Found it today. Bloody hell! But but was there something being supplied off this, or was it just isolated, or what? It was. It was. There was nothing connected into it, but it was. Right. It was. Um... <laughs> just as well. Yeah. It never worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. But it's a good one. It's a good one. Um, and so I think what what the point the point of this one is is if you saw it. Um, or more importantly, it's for the inspector. If when you're looking at a board, um, just remember, I know it's the things we come, become kind of complacent on a bit. Single phase, three phase. The minute you go to three phase distribution, there's certain rules and certain additional things you need to be looking for. And this is a perfect example, which is why I put it up. Mm. If you're finding double pole breakers in a three phase board, immediately, what's going on here? Uh, how is this working? What's gone on? Has somebody done something? Are the terminals loose? Loose for a reason, obviously, because they don't want to short on the um, the other phase and short out and go bang. But um, this is a prime example of sometimes it gets missed. And and that's why I showed it. So for me, I would, uh, I'd see to that. Yeah, I wouldn't argue to that. Um, and that's not installed anymore anyway. So, um, mm. but yeah, I would see to that straight away. But just, um, I mean, just, does it work anymore? Do you know? Um, well, as soon as you turn it on, it's going to go bang, isn't it? Funnily enough, so. funny you say that. That's the reason I was there. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, it did go bang. Um, but yeah, that's there you go. Because sometimes people get complacent; they don't think. And this is why I was always taught: before you would get anywhere near free phase, you need to be able to seriously keep your wits about you. Because when you mm. learn a framework a single phase and then go to free phase, it's a different game. There's different rules of engagement that we need to consider. Um, and that, to me, is a perfect example. That raises so many questions, dude. Oh, That's I don't even go there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, but it's a perfect example of if you've got single and double pole breakers mixed, have a think. If you've got single and free phase breakers, yeah, okay. Free mm. phase circuit, single phase circuit, fine. But that one straight away raises alarm bells for me. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so what I want to do, uh, what's everybody else put? Uh, distribute neutral kit not installed. Wow. Um, is anybody agreeing with my C2? Oh, some people All say C2. C2. Okay, I can't really see this anymore. It's not playing up. Yeah, you got, you got a mix. Somebody said a mix of breakers in as well. You have, and you've got yeah, a, you have, a yeah, YLX yeah. Um, and, a, and a Dorman Smith, or yeah. two Dorman Smiths, because there's oh, one yeah. below it as well, isn't there? We're going to be doing a podcast and there's no, on. There's no legacy like between those, is there? Dorman Smith no. isn't. Not nope. in any way related to Wilex, is it? Correct. Wilex is Electrium. The Where's Dobby is, Smith gone to? The trouble is, chaps, is there's this old, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use term, there's this old belief that come, I remember when I was an apprentice, as long as it was the same shape and it fitted uh, on the DIN rail, you could use it. It was a horrendous, it was a horrendous attitude, but it was a culture that still exists with a lot of sparks because that's what they were taught. And it's yeah. the wrong attitude. And I think we'll end up doing a podcast eventually on that, Paul, about this. And I think so. I keep saying about, you know, pollution categories with eugenics well, and things. We were talking know. about that earlier. That's coming. Um, yeah, yeah. In fact, actually, um, Schneider have just agreed to come on our podcast to talk about it. Awesome. awesome. Which is going to be awesome. The person who wrote the paper is going to come on. So I arranged that today. Oh, um, wow. Okay, great. Yeah, so that's coming. Um, but yeah, so now everybody knows it's coming. So it goes for it. Better happen. We have, um, we have to do it now, will we? We'll have to do it now. But don't worry, there's some more news I can tell you, but I'm not going to tell you on this. Um, next one, which is my Go. personal favourite, and I know it's your father's favourite. Let's see if this works. There you go. Wow. <laughs> what does everybody think the minute we see that? That's a two at least. 
because my brain says premature collapse, premature collapse, premature collapse. Yeah. Um, now, we know we've seen worse, um, mm -hmm. definitely, but this is an interesting one because it's an old building with old concrete lintels. Um, and what and they used to do is... roof. Yes, it is. Good spot. Yes, it is. It's um, sheet roof. Indeed. So you can't drill or fix. Um, and somebody has had the, the clever brain to put some Unistrut in and then lay an armoured on top of it um, as a form of um, protection against premature collapse. Whereas everybody else has just decided to stuff it in. Don't worry too much about it. Plastic tie wraps everywhere. Not really great. Um, and that just, just just reminds me straight away of one of the reasons why we need to be a bit more considerate when cables are placed out of way. Um, for me, premature collapse... I know there's lots of people who debate whether it's C3, C2, C1. No. It's always a C2 no. in my world. Always, yeah. as a minimum. Um, to yeah, be fair, fight, to fight warn them. Well, uh, yeah. you know, Dave, fight, my, fight, warn them. You know yeah. my, my personal belief is the, the premature collapse regulation is the only socially and morally duty-bound regulation that exists. That, uh, that ultimate protection of life where we know it's been taken, the fact that we as an industry argue about it is just mind-blowing it's for it's, the cost of some clips and metal bands it is it, and i, I got quite right upset. i got quite upset when it first came out because i was i was doing some work with a company about pv and i was going around their company different factories around the uk doing talks to their engineering team about pv and this other guy was talking about the latest amendments of the 7671 and he mentioned this and the guys in the factory would always go oh yeah but that's not retrospective is it Mm -hmm. And we've always said the BS seven six seven one's you know not retrospective. We can't assess an observation differently, you know, as it upgrades to how it was. This one, it's not the fact that we suddenly say it's just we've not paid attention for all this time, or we've so, not been looking, and we have just, to look at how this works retrospectively. This is one that when I do IET events, and Paul knows this, when I do IET events and we discuss this, if anybody says it's not retrospective, I'll turn around and say you tell that to a dead person's family. This, this is too emotionally a charge to reg for me um, yeah. to have those sorts of debates. It's if another one where we have to... Construction design and management regulations. Yeah. Another statute law that's out there. Uh, the, 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 the fire integrity of buildings has been required for a very long time. Yes, it has. It's been in 5839, it's been in 5266 mm -hmm. for a long time. But it's just not been in 7671. They've had to bring it in because the sparks have ignored the fire integrity of the structures that they're messing around with. Funnily enough, there was a lot actually in the old, there was a piece of legislation, I can't remember off the top of my head, that required premises to have a fire safety certificate issued by the fire brigade. And that gave the fire brigade the ability to poke around and, you know, say, that's not good enough, this is not good enough. And then they took it off and the reform order okay, just then, allowed yeah. chaos. To rain supreme. Yeah, I mean, one of the first things the reform order did was get rid of the certificates. Fire the, inspectors. the fire inspections from, was that 71? No, was it was like the act back then? Phil, you would have been doing yeah. fire inspections fire you back, back in the day, or? Well, when, when I was in the fire brigade, the fire brigade, we used to go out and do fire inspections of buildings and of, of workplaces. Uh, and then during my time in the fire brigade, we stopped doing it. And that was deemed. It was partly because uh, people were too busy or people didn't want to sort of pay for it or whatever. So, it, But it was at one time a service that the fire brigades provided and they would go out and do fire inspections of different buildings and different work workplaces. Mm. Uh, well, as I say, it, it got taken away. That, that duty was taken away from the fire service. I think it's um, coming back now as a, as a pay-in service. You can now mm. pay the fire brigade to come and do it for you. Yeah. The you thing is, can run here. Yeah. Again, it's one of those things that, you know, rather than looking in the regs all the time, if you look at the Electricity at Work Regulations, look at the Health and Safety at Work Act, it says there that if you see something, if you if you come across something which you is is dangerous or causes a hazard, then you have a duty to report it and take action over it. Yeah. I think the big, um, one, of the biggest, one of the biggest problems we have is we've got this 20-year turnout of you know, inspectors in our industry now. As soon as they see this, they'll just go limp. Yeah, so they'll throw they'll throw limit yeah. this and they my won't Lord, look further. My Lord, if I just could remind you of Regulation Six of Electricity at Work Regulations, electrical equipment which may reasonably foreseeably be exposed to mechanical damage, effects of weathers, natural hazards, temperature, blah 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 blah, flammable or explosive substances, shall be of such construction or necessary protected to prevent, as far as reasonably practicable, danger for some such exposure. 
Um, reasonably practicable. Remember when you're arguing with a judge, I couldn't afford an extra few quid for some steel tie wraps or metal yeah. fixings. Yeah. And it was interesting. We were looking at the 2396 recently, David. Yeah. We were looking at the 2396, the design and verification course. The examiner's uh, we the paperwork. Of that. We were looking at the examiner's papers, and it was one of the things that the examiners brought up. Um, overall, the latest, well, for the last few years, the, uh, the exams have been fairly poorly answered uh, and attempted. Uh, I think there was a 70% failure rate in the last round of the exams on the design and verification course. And one of the things they highlighted was the fact that people weren't giving due attention to the support of cables, uh, especially the fact that the cables need to be supported outside of and beyond the period of evacuation of the building to enable the safe uh, activities of firefighter, firefighters. And they actually highlighted that in the 2396 course as one of the big sort of problems that people yeah. aren't paying due attention to. You see, a lot of standards focus on fire performance for escape. Now, 5839 mentions briefly about firefighter entanglement. 7671 now mentions firefighting entanglement, but that's, uh, I think, one of the biggest issues, and we've had this with our industry, is that we've, just been, we've not been too bothered because as long as the system has integrity for our escape, what they're not thinking about is the ability for firefighters who go into a building to then be able to safely leave the building. Um, so can, can I give you one last one? I'm going to yeah. hopefully you can see this. Yep. Um, this is one of my personal favorites. This is an oldie but a goodie. So this was a, a refurbishment done where the, um, the electrical installation, the main switch room and plant room, it was um, wired in red and black singles. And the CMS was the earthing. It was the method of CPC for the circuits. Right. So, of course, what happened was people came into the switch room, they chopped everything out. Um, and what you've got here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, you can see one of the old line and neutral conductors there. And that's the old containment system rebushed in with a galvanized box. And what they did was they put brand new boards in, live neutral and earth, into these connector blocks wrapped in tape with a live and neutral. Two, and that two. was how we found it. And I'm not so sure that was there for years. So that's like an, a, an extension or moving of the board? Uh, yeah, effectively, yeah. It was basically the room was refurbished with a new piece of plant and new boards. So obviously they moved the old trunk and ripped it all out. And it turns out upon investigation that the, um, they only realized after they ripped out all this trunking, when they were going through it all, they were going, where's all the CPCs? Connected it all up in the hope that the, the connection in the back would give them some form of overall earth continuity but when the first eicr was due they tested a, a, a lighting column and it was like seven thousand ohms mm. yeah now see if you didn't if you didn't sorry paul go for it no i was gonna say the the, the the fantastical thing about that is they connected it all up and hoped where was the testing on their eic um there wasn't one yeah, that's it what was, I was going to go The job to. was signed off by project managers under pressure to meet a milestone for the government. So this, government this, this is not on my place. railway, by the way, for anybody yeah, asks. Yeah. I would never tolerate this shit. Someone would die for this, but yeah. This would anyway, be a nightmare to test. That would be a nightmare to test. To me, to me, I, I mean, I know everybody will probably say, oh, it's C2, C2. For me, this is a C1 and find whoever did it and re-educate them massively. Um, uh, the thing is, you've got multiple potentials of fault there. You've got public milling around in the area where if a fault occurs, you know, you could kill a member of the public. Yeah. Or several members of the public. Yeah. So, yeah, strictly speaking, it's a C2 because yeah. you have to have, there's a latent defect and something else has to go wrong to cause a hazard. Yeah. But, but it's such a major muck up you know you can half a dozen c2s in one box you know how many how many c2s does it take to make a c1 like <laughs> yeah i know yeah i know, yeah. You know? um chaps. there is an argument to that isn't there is the fact that if you've got multiple faults that might all be c2 uh might, may not in themselves independently uh merit a c1 there comes a point in time where you just look at an installation well this is such crap I'm going to put a C1 on this because it is really, really poor. It's really dangerous. And the only way that anybody's going to take it seriously is if I stick a mm. C1 on it. But isn't Does that it not, the, the Isn't it not just a fireball? 
is it not justifiable to say, right, okay, if I've got one or two things that are potentially dangerous, fine. If I've got 10 to 20 things that are potentially dangerous, is that not more dangerous? Well, yeah, yeah. It's, added danger, isn't it? it's cumulative, isn't it? It's a cumulative yeah. effect. So there's definitely there's definitely a there's definitely a reasonable. If you were doing a risk there. assessment, if you were doing a risk yeah. so let's say ah, let's say I'm then. the inspector. Hang on, Paul. Hang on. <laughs> no, no, if I'm the no, inspector no. and I take this to a client who has no knowledge, if I say there's there's 25 C2s to them, it's the admin of 25 C2s. They won't understand it. This is mm. where the danger notification and the whole duty of care. If you say you've got uh, 25 C2s, by the way, this is, this is C1. This is a, a major incident waiting to happen. And you, you need to educate your clients. You need to help support them while also discharging that duty. And it's a very difficult conversation to have, but it's one that has to happen, um, sadly. Otherwise, they'll just think, uh, uh, again, it's the tone and the nature of how you do it. Um, I, I've always said that a lot of inspectors, within 10 minutes going into installation, you're generally going to suss out, especially in a domestic home, whether it's a pass or a fail. Um, yeah. You know, you check your bonding, bonding ain't placed straight away, you're going to fail it. Um, and then you're checking through the boards, fault finding, seeing all the lash ups and the joints and the weird concoctions that we find in wiring. Um, but it's how you report that to the client is so key. So key. Sorry, Paul, you were going to say. No, no, I was going to agree with you, mate. Um, the thing is, 767 only looks at a single fault scenario. That's the problem. We don't, we don't look at multiple fault scenarios. Yes. And this is where... The risk assessment that you've just suggested is so valuable. So on a risk assessment, if you have five C2s to risk assess and manage, um, 25 C2s and 10 C1s is a far higher risk profile for someone to have to manage who isn't technical. That's where they will want to put their arm around you, hopefully, and say, help me reduce risk. Because any, any place of employment that employs people, if you have failed EICRs, they will probably, and this is what annoys me because I'm a client, is most employers will not understand the level of risk that they are importing into their business, nor how to manage it because you're just a contractor. This is why everything you do, if you're working, and I'm not talking about domestic now for a minute, if you're working commercial industrial, make sure all of your uh, danger notifications gets to someone who works in safety. Because yeah. if it does, I guarantee you it will get action damn quick. Can I just throw something else in the mix there? Um, I do have, have a very good friend who's an insurance broker. Uh, he does my insurances as it happens. I've become friendly with him because he used to, to does my insurances. And, and one of the things that he's made perfectly clear to me and has become apparent because of some of the claims that he has dealt with, that if you do not have a satisfactory EICR for your premises, your business insurance may well be null and void. Even if your claim has nothing to do with the electrical installation. Yep. They, they had one where there was an incident with a forklift and a vehicle in their yard unloading wagons. It was, a, it was a delivery company. So the insurance company came to, in, to investigate and the loss adjuster came in because obviously they wanted to mit the insurance company wanted to mitigate their risk, minimize the amount they're going to pay out basically. So the loss adjuster went through everything and he went to the company that were there, right? Can I see your pat testing records, please? And the company went, we pat testing? I mean, we're talking about a forklift accident in the yard. And they went, so what do our pat testing records have to do with it? He said, oh, if you look at your policy, your schedule, your requirements, under clause X, Y, Z, whatever it was, you're required to at all times have uh, satisfactory results on all your pat testing, on all the appliances you have in the property, the premises. Uh, have you got those results? Well, no. Oh, sorry, uh, you're not insured. Very true. Very true. And this is a, another thing a lot of people don't really um, get as well. If you do have, I mean, if you hold a, a, an unsatisfactory EICR, you need to have suitable and sufficient risk reduction measures and techniques employed to ensure that you can stand in front of a judge and said, I had this non-compliant EICR given to me by a contractor, and yep. these are the measures I took in this timeline and in the meantime these so um for instance if you have a failed eicr and you're working in a factory and there's five buildings in that factory you may the minute you get that report enhance the maintenance increase mm. the frequency of inspections yeah we um we, we mentioned this on a previous podcast or site didn't we um yeah. where we said i think it was when we were talking to richard from pe he asked us yeah. a question about um a client and it's the same thing there isn't it if 
if you've got a client, you've done an EICR, it's unsatisfactory, they may not have the coffers, you know, it might be reasonably practicable to remedy the C1s and C2s, but you've got the person there, you've got the electrical, electrically competent person who can work with the client to develop a safer way of controlling that risk by doing some smaller work. I remember when um, I worked with Phil and we were at uh, Ascot, can you remember that nursery in Ascot? Huh? And we took the NIC to it. Huh? You remember that bore change, yeah? There was lots of problems, but we, we went with a approach where, okay, it's a business, we can't just take all the money to fix the problems, but there was a strategy, you know? Um, it was interesting because when the NIC came, he wanted to look at everything. We just showing him the board that we replaced. But we, we had an approach where we looked at the, the risk and the business has to operate and the business has to control, uh, has to stay in, in, in operation. But as, Paul, as you said, Paul, they have to really be in control of their increased level of risk due to their, yeah. their new understanding of that risk. And they uh, need to put this, a plan in place. Plan, a plan of improvement. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is just something that is, it just, 7671 doesn't do anything there. Guys like Street doesn't do anything there. 2391 doesn't do anything there. No. But if electricians could talk to the client and the first thing they say is, what do you need to carry on with your business? What is maybe, you know, revenue critical in your business? And then here is the problems. And then you can prioritize. The client's just going to obviously get what they want. They're going to get more value from you. You know, and at the same time, if you're throwing legislations with your codes, yeah, this C1's not complied with that reg, but that's also electricity work regulations six, uh, 14 or 15 or whatever. You know, that's just going to be a lot more um, information for them. So I think it's, it's, gonna... it's, it's fair to say one of the things I do currently with my electrical contractors is if they highlight anything, I ask them to raise the code. But if it's non-7671 even, I will say to them, find the standard, find the clause, link it to the legislation. And the reason I do that is, is more for their education. And what I, what I seem to find in any electrical contractor, I find they go, well, we're not used to doing that. But the minute they do do it, I can't argue with them. Yeah, because they've discharged a duty under a, you know, a, a standard for lighting columns or something. And, uh, you know, the requirements of Health and Safety at Work Act to provide a, a safe workplace. What am I going to do? Say, no, mate, sorry, I can't accept your quote to fix that. I've got no choice. I have to undertake the work mm. and I have to go and find the money. But that's not the contractor's problem. It's the client's problem. And the contractor is helping me to reduce my business risk, my safety risk, my operational risk, my manufacturing risk, whatever risk that I may hold important. Because and it should be fairly, we... it should be fairly scalable in that, you know, you know, the, with regards to the scale of the business and the scale of the risk or all the costs. major commercial industrial you know. companies, all they care about is risk mm. money. Risk is equal to money. It's as simple as that. And, and, and electrical contractors, the, the, the more we understand how we can dial into that risk mindset, um, the more we'll make commercial industry. Domestic, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Now, lads, how do I get my screen share off? Because I've no idea. All I can see is four little boxes. I think I can nick your screen, actually. Go for so it. I want to show one last if I can. Go for it. Uh, that one. Let me move all the chat and stuff out the way. I can't actually see a thing. Go on, then. Can you see that? No, we're still looking at Paul's. Paul, uh, no, you to... stop, stop yeah. sharing the screen. There we go. He's there found go. it. I found it. Yeah. <laughs> good. yeah. Uh, Paul, you should. Uh, love those, don't we? You, sh you should now be able to share yours, Paul. We can't see yours yet. You've got to reshare it. Buddy. All right. Okay. Hang Just on. Unshare and reshare. Um. Yeah. Is it coming up? Oh, here we go. That one is it. Share. Here we go. Oh, those wonderful things. <sighs> oh, Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, that was a supermarket. Yes. Um, you can see the price labels on the shelves. Beep, beep. It's not yeah, every little helps. Uh. Or is it? No, Jonathan, it's not boots. <laughs> the trouble is, is, it's it's the placebo effect that people think they give. Yes. Let me ask. Let me ask. I asked you this question before. I don't know if you actually got back to me on it, mate. Where are things going? Obviously, because um, Mr. Peacock tragically died, didn't he, he David? Away, yes, he has. He's passed away. Who's picking up the reins with Fatally Flawed, mate? He has some family and friends. Uh, they've had an awful lot of trouble with the with the host, the web host, and the email provider. Yeah. 
basically his wife, uh, uh, indulge me a moment. Um, his wife was named in his will as his sole beneficiary. Yep. And executor. However, the web hosting company and the email hosting company wouldn't deal with her. They wanted a. They wanted to speak to Mr. Peacock, oh, even after hard. he passed away. Oh, uh, so, for you guys in the chat who may not know, if you've ever seen the website Fatally Flawed, which I think is, a, you know, it's it's a very well shared and known campaign. It must be 15 years old now. That. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, We've had a few minor and, wins recently, though, I have to say. We have, yeah. And it's got all the information. It's got the study. It's got stuff off the shelf. Just basically throwing the evidence as to why the safety socket covers are not suitable and should not be um, in, in on the shelves. Um, and we did write a letter to j Pell just before he it passed did. away. And I, that did get submitted. It did get submitted. It went in. Okay. And we have Ooh. had a response from the IET in that I think Mark Cole's there was an article in Wiring Matters last year. Another, another article came out in Wiring Matters, damning them again. Yeah. You know? uh, Napit, um, Frank, Dirty, or one of the Napit guys wrote an article in the Napit Competent Person magazine on these things, the fact that they are no no use. Yeah. Um, one of the nursery, I think it's the, one of the English um, government um Child Nurseries Association, I don't know what it's called now, forgive me, sorry guys. Um, mm. They came up and they have banned them across yeah. um, all the nurseries. Or they've the banned them, they call it to ban them. They've suggested, they've said that they're not necessary. The yeah. NHS countrywide have come up with a ban completely. They, but I still see them in my doctors, in oh. my dentists. I see them uh, everywhere. Hang on. It's crazy. Um, um, you know. <clears throat> They're not, oh, there we go. That is a dentist surgery. Mm. My dentist surgery. Um, no, no, that's the that's the, my local pub. That is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the that. table. That's it. We we'll go back to that. Yeah. Uh, so you know, guys, if you see them, you know, explain to the explain to the company to the to the to the user why point them to fatally flawed. These things are a death trap. Yeah. Yeah, they are. I actually, when I was doing an EICR of a school in um, Sunderland, there was this little trolley, a little mobile bookcase trolley that was wheeled around in one of the um, common rooms. And as I pulled it out to go to a socket to do a ZS test, it actually, as I pulled it out, half of this fell on the floor and the other half was still in where it had been smashed into the socket by this trolley. And obviously the half that was stuck in was the earth pin. So the live pins were left open. Mm. Yeah, so and I took photos at the time. Um, these must okay. be a codable item, surely. I'd see to it. I would. What'd you, what would you do? Paul's, Paul's like, oh. yeah, I agree with you, and 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 and, and, and I think I think we should be C two in them because they don't meet any recognised product standard. No. For electrical appliances, and, and the BS thirteen sixty three socket outlet is only designed to accept BS thirteen sixty three plugs, which these are not. Yeah, and yeah, and their their site, yeah, their site has shown that they compromise another standard. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 similar to, for example, having some device that you throw on. Let's say, for example, I had a device that I could put onto an RCBO to just see what temperature it gets to, but it actually compromises six one double nine. If it compromises it, it can't be safe. And you know, one three six three is compromised, so it's got to be removed it's got yeah. to be potentially dangerous in my view um yeah. I, I, I get a bit i, I get a bit frustrated because i see an article why it matters and i'll see the same article rewritten and refreshed five years later but i don't see i don't see enough like you say that frank or napit started to do some stuff That'd frank from napit um to be fair to frank and mike um i spoke to them about this and i said look dave's on his last legs he's, you know is this something you can do for us and and they did write an article um I would say it was it directly in response to me asking them, but I did discuss it and it, it did come out, um, guiding that the NAPIT members should advise their customers that these things are, you know. So the question, why is yes. the industry not grouping together and asking trading standards to ban them? Because yes, people are making money out of them. Okay. Mother care are making money out of them. CPC Farnell are making money out of them. I saw them for sale in- so um, trading standards. 
Well, and map, that, map, and map, they were for sale in like Maplins and stuff before they went yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're, they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah, some products right. aren't great for the industry. Moving on. Yes, yeah. okay. Um, which way do you want to go? Left or right? Pick away. Don't care. Okay. Where are we okay here? Is it the tape? No, it's... No. Um, oh, is it the... Oh. Yeah. Oh. Toy. This is bypassing the RCD. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. It's coming out of the main switch, and instead of feeding yeah. the RCD and then back into the in the buzz bar and what have you, they've taken the buzz bar out of the RCD, moved it along, and fed it straight off the main switch because he couldn't stop the RCD from tripping. Because he had so he many just... single circuits on one RCD, he had about 40 uh... million amps of leakage. Uh... Okay, so yeah, it's preventing leakage, causing tripping, so he's bypassed it, one idiot. Yeah. C2, C2 for me. C2. Yeah, so, I mean, question, I mean, question, I mean, yeah, there's obviously the code for regards to that action. <laughs> but and I see three. Yeah. Um, the countersunk screws fixing the board to the wall as well. You don't like countersunk pan, screws, do you? Pan, I hate countersunk screws. They're for wood. They're not for, not for boards. Pan head with a penny washer. Use the right fixing. No, I that hate, depends. I, no, that depends on the mechanical design of the board, though. Yeah, yeah, Paul, I agree with you, but you and I both know these boards are not designed for that. I've installed too many boards in domestic to realise that a panhead screw is the only thing you should be using, not a countersunk. It just chews on the edges of the metal. It's worse when you see a penny washer with a countersunk screw. It's awful fixing. It's just not good workmanship. Anyway, stop, stop me ranting about that. Um, <laughs> B2 on the bypass. Uh, yeah, so how do I say the board? Yeah. How do we isolate the board on that then? Hopes and dreams. Um, there's it's a oh, it's a dual real Wilex fill. Um, oh, uh, high integrity. That one. Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh, Jesus. Let's let's do two more and then we'll look at the questions and then we'll wrap up because we're, we're an hour and yes. a half now. Yeah, no problem. So that's another one. So pick two more, Paul, for us to look at. Okay. Well, tell me when to stop then. Oh, hang on. There's a haircut going on there. Look, look at that. All right. Stop. Stop. No, Paul. Stop. 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 There we go. Yeah. What? How many strands left? <laughs> oh. About That's half of them. That's the C2 uh, for me, for definite. C2 so without C2... doubt. Phil would go with a C1 on that, would you, boy? For the Think about loading. Depending on the loading. If the Depending loading, on the loading. is sufficient, I would go with a C1. If yep. it's more than what's left on the cable, I would C1 it. Yeah. Yeah. That's not good, is it? This was new. Build, this was a new build, mate. This can I just, a, a, this can was, I just add into this conversation? The one thing that this is reminding me of, though, when I first started out, a lot of the sparks who were um, my seniors, my peers, they were very, very easy at failing stuff, C one ing coding stuff to fail because they wouldn't tolerate poor installations. And we yeah. now seem to have. I don't know if it was the sixteenth to the seventeenth where they got rid of C fours and it all kind of went a bit weird. Um, that we've kind of watered down how we code. I don't know, but I, I, I kind of agree with Phil on these C2s and C1s most days of the week, to be honest with you. And you end up yeah. stopping the, after you get to 20. This is the whole board uh, that we've been looking at the small uh, close-up self. Okay, so we've got right. some connector blocks flowing in, flowing uh, in the yeah, board there. Floating in there. Oh, don't, don't. This, this was an absolute, an absolute disaster. Is this the one you were uh, expert oh, I know. for? Oh, yeah. I, I know this thought one. I, I thought I remember this board. I remember this, this board. <laughs> this is a brand new house, isn't it? Brand, new, brand house. new Yeah, brand new house. A multi-million pound brand new house. This is one where the homeowners were getting shocks. And it yes. was, there was, there were so many pages of reports that most of Wales ran out of paper <laughs> when this was done. I remember it well. So, mm. uh, yeah. I mean, look at that. That, that was, that was as, it, as we found it. That was as we found it. That mm. was as we found it. I think the the bigger frustration from all this is, you know, we were kind of in the loop with what was going on, and the CPS engagement with this was not great. No, it wasn't. It was virtually was it? non-existent. It wasn't. One of the CPSs helped uh, me with the report to give us a to give us a, a a CPS overview on it, if you remember. Yeah. yeah. After I'd written it to see what they, um, you know, they they volunteered. One of their guys volunteered to. To look at a few of the code and stuff because it was that serious but we got the we got the we got the brand new house rewired how sad is that that's crazy 
But again, when you've got installation like that, you wouldn't trust anything you couldn't see. No, that, that was the point. That was wouldn't exactly trust the it. point we were making. The, was uh, it inspected it. and tested when it was actually installed? Yeah, yeah. I've got it. I've, I've still got the paperwork. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They passed it. Yeah, yeah of course they did. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Look at it. <laughs> Yeah. It I, was, remember um, these. I remember these. Was, this was horrific. Right, I, this is one of Ryan's, I think. Um, that's an isolate without a handle on it. This is one of Ryan's. Oh, yeah, let's go with this. Oops, it is. Right. Let's go with this Paul, one, actually. Paul, last one. Last one. Yeah, last one. Yeah, last one. Yeah. So that's just the, the cables hanging out the back. So not even terminated properly. What's going on? Where are the cables coming in from? I think they're coming from down there. There's a here. connector block in there, isn't there? Is no, there a connector a block connector through there. that hole? There is a metal box there. Can you zoom in that hole, Paul? Yeah, certainly. Is there a connector block through there? No, I think it's no, just three. The box is sunk back. It's yeah. sunk okay. back, and that's yeah. the aperture where the cables are coming in, and it's all been bonded around. But they it's do really, like, really they short. They look like connector blocks. They do. All, all right, so we've got no too sign too short. of. Cable's too short. Too yeah, short. The minute you take the socket off, it's just pinged out the uh, the um. It's broken off, it hasn't it? Because yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's it's broken off short there. Yep. Yeah, it snapped off. So it's, I'm suspecting that's a ring circuit. Yeah. Now, would you report that, or would you just remedy it while you're doing the testing? Because you're going to fix that to get your tests done, aren't you? Well, ah, they look... to be honest, I know I said earlier on I wouldn't fix anything, but something like that, I probably would, as long as the cable was long enough to reach. Yeah. You didn't have to add anything or crimp anything. Yeah. If it's just a case of maybe re-terminate and then put it in. Yeah. You'd probably still take a picture of it as a record oh, of the point totally. of your point, your point of your totally. work. Totally. Totally. Well, if you're not yeah. getting that back in, you're going to end up having a stitch drill underneath it gently, get the cables into a few spur, and then oh, oh it'd be a baller. Yeah. You'd be there all day. <laughs> Trust me, I've had this. I've had sockets like this where I've unscrewed it, pulled it a little bit, it's all broke off, and there was no physical way of getting that. And then I've had to mark out a box below, intercept the cables without damaging them, put a new box in, use that penetration through, refeed it off of a few spur, and the client's gone, what have you done that for? Well, it was either leave you with no power because your cables mm. are knackered and they're too short, or do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Just, it's a nuisance, they are. Um, it's when you find something like that and you've got VAR in there, that's the problem. Oh, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's what oh, you know. I, you're, not, you're not going anywhere, anywhere else today. <laughs> right. Okay, um, you, you, you can... You can you can stop sharing now if you want to, buddy. Okay, well, um, certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, the other images that you've got, hold on to them, though, because what we'll do is we'll do another one of these, and we'll get Jono to come on as well. Yeah. Uh, I think he's know. got a lot to offer because uh, yeah. he's, um, he's still out there doing a lot of this stuff, you know? Exactly. That'd be great. Um, okay, so there's a couple of questions. Um, we talked about C2 and then becoming the C1. So Ben said, unless you're rectifying it before you leave site, I don't see why a C1 would be taken any more seriously than a C2. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. Guidance yeah. Note 3 does say you should take action. If it's a C1, you should take action before you leave site. You right. can't leave a C1. Yeah. Okay, but what but if... I can go back to just just a, an example. Yeah. I came across a fuse board which was fed off an armoured cable, which was fed off, it was fed off a, a, another distribution board, with a bit of trunking, metal trunking underneath it, and an armoured cable came out, was terminated into the trunking, and then went off to feed a sub-distribution board. The armoured cable itself, the armoured gland, had no lock nut on it, had no banjo, had no fly earth on it, so it was only actually picking up an earth by gravity, the weight of the armoured cable sitting on top of the metal trunking. Jeez. It still gave me an earth at the second board, mm. okay? And because we are told, yeah, if it's earthing, you know, we can see to it, it's, you know, it's, it's only dangerous under fault. I put a C2 on it. So it's unsatisfactory, C2. I didn't take immediate action. And I C2'd it. I went back there nine months later. It's still like it. And I now wish I'd C1'd it. Phil, do you know what I find with uh, EICRs as well is there is almost a fear um, at, in the non-domestic world of producing C1s. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been on installations and I've received reports where I may have, say, 100 C2s and maybe one C1. You go out and look for yourself and you'll find 30 C1s mm. and, and 10 times the amount. And, and this is the problem. Um, unless you identify the extent and limitation of your EICR, and it's very clear to all, uh, that's your bookend, that's your start, and at your end, 
is discharging that duty care. If you don't get those two points right, the middle is just a very dangerous swamp. Yeah, and that's why I'm now, rather than just taking guidance note three and the guidance that's in there, rather than just taking that as when it comes to coding, I'm also now looking at electricity work regs, health and safety work act, other statutory legislation, and risk assessing what the likely risks will be if the appropriate action isn't taken very quickly. Mm. Yeah. Yep. So, okay. Yep. Sorry. No, I was going to say next question. Um, right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to the Q and a section here. Um, for David has said 411.3.3 emission of RCD. There are three options in code breakers. Uh, and he goes and so no. he says, no, no factory I go to actually has risk assessments in place. You know, so the the idea of not needing an RCD if you had a risk assessment carried out. Um, yeah. He basically says, "Have we? Has anybody ever been to a site that had a risk assessment been undertaken?" No. I've done them. Paul's probably I've attached them to mine. Hmm. I've done them. I did it for the Docklands Art Railway. Um, Docklands Art Railway. Every single LV circuit was an RCD, and none of them worked because the DC traction system saturated them, blinded them. Yeah. Um, so uh, we ended up changing them for non-RCDs but what we did was we took all reasonable steps so with RCD selection now um, it's any RCD I use is a minimum type A regardless of where, I, of where it is because we know there are DC issues in all electrical installations so in, now in Paul Meenan's brain is there no such yes. thing as an ACRCD no anymore? absolutely not in fact I've just written a scope yesterday that says AC, the use of ACRCDs is banned and right. I've put that in my scope that I wrote yesterday. It is banned. They are not to be used. So as a minimum, I'm offering six milliamps of DC blinding immunity. However, yeah. and that is a minimum. It's, it's a minimum. A lot, now, yeah. if I have knowledge that I have more than that leakage, then I have to up that to only 10. After that, the only thing I've got is um, the Blakely stuff, which goes up to half an amp. And after that, why would I use an RCD? I'd have to go hmm. back to fundamental principles you know, overcurrent protection, selection direction, mechanical protection. So what we did was we changed all, the, all of the um, circuit, RCD, sorry, on the railway back to LC, MCBs for anywhere where the public could touch a piece of electrical installation, which could potentially be vandalized. We said we would have a DC immune RCD to offer enhanced protection and reduce risk. Anything that was placed out of reach, standard MCB protection should afford us overcurrent protection plus control measures call outs training etc etc and that was what was our rcd now when i wrote that it was just at the turn of the 17th edition and i rung yeah. up the nic and asked them if they had a template and they said no and i said well i'll just do mine and they said can we have yours um but part of it is it ended up in the code breaker of the one i did for the dlr but um it's it's not that hard when you know what your operations are um and you know what controls you have competence you need i think the trouble is clients don't really do much of this one of the struggles with saying to electricians or regulations that there should be a risk assessment yeah is you've got to know the client's requirements yes. it's easy for you to do your risk assessment you're the client or you're working in the area but for a lot of electricians that are working or visiting a client you know it's, it's that it's getting a that client, information a, paul knows this if a client ha does engineering or manufacturing or plant, they should have a technical authority somewhere. Well, they should. Now that that may be so. that may be contracted out mm. to the um, you know their via their facilities management people, and they may have a clause somewhere in a contract that says our electrical expertise is done via X, Y, and Z Joe Bloggs. Now I guarantee you, knock on Joe Bloggs' door and go, "Have you got your RCD emissions? Have you got this?" They'll just go, "No, mate. We just do the FMA." We just do the facilities management, fixing, changing bulbs. And this is where the gaps appear. But they're not just gaps, they're opportunities to reduce risk. The, 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 one thing I would comment it. on, um, yes, you're talking about electricians doing risk assessment. We're back then to offering a professional opinion. Yes. You better be damn sure you've got professional indemnity insurance, especially if you're a sole trader, yep. if you're putting your house on the line. Indeed. Indeed, valid, um, valid point. David Beckridge yeah. has said uh, there, um, no factory go to has a risk assessment in place. Have you ever found one? And have you ever found you ever get involved in doing one? I can't find any firms to help the client undertake one. <clears throat> it's what There's I do one on the screen. As yeah. me. This is what this is what this bit up here is. This is what I do. 
Yeah, you're about to. Uh, if it's if I'd say to everybody that they're about to start unleashing and witnessing the um, the sheer mind blowing knowledge of Mr. Skirm on our podcasts, I think it's fair to say. The, um, yeah, I've had another inquiry in today um, for a, basically a water company have uh, engaged a, a contractor to build a water pumping station for them, and they've mucked it up. Can I wipe the floor with the contractor, please? I don't know if you'd wipe the floor with them. You'd be a mop then, but um, you mean offer engineering judgment? Yes. Right, okay. Just remember, Paul, Paul, just remember we're live. Paul, we're live. Yeah, I know. <laughs> just remember that. We're live, okay? okay. Yeah. Do your yeah. thing. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, there's, a, there's a lot of companies out there that don't have that, um, what, Paul, what do you call it, the, the, the engineering authority. Yes, in, the engineering technical the authority. Hmm. Yeah, because they've been unnecessary. I've worked with many clients and I've asked those small questions, you know, and you start to realize when there's no response that there are no authorities in many organizations, no rules, procedures, authorization, procedures, protocols. And then, you know, I get to that point where I go, right, well, how many more questions do I ask before they ask me to bloody write the solutions? And that often happens. Yeah. Um, you know, you ask questions, you end up writing the solutions to your own bloody questions with some of these companies. Yeah, you do without a doubt. Uh, David then says, does anyone actually conduct SPD calculations in domestics while conducting EICRs? I haven't done a domestic EICR for a while, I will confess. Um, so you're I don't, doing a domestic... I don't do the calculations. No? I don't do the calculations. The calculations um, are... I just, I just talk to the client. Yeah, the calculation is the, the last... For... It's the last part of it, isn't it? Yeah. Only if you can't comply with the intent of the regulation do you then do the calc. Yeah. You don't just sit there and go, oh, I'm going to do the calc. You, mm. you go through the four requirements of the standard uh, and, and look at the value of the fixed installation. As you said, Phil, discuss with the client. Yeah. Um, if I'm doing I'm, an EICR, you know, you look at what equipment they've got and just sort of suggest to them and explain to them what an SPD would, uh, SPD will do for them. But that's the key. Um, would we code it? Because I wouldn't code not having an SPD. Even though it's a requirement yeah. of the regulation, I would make it an observation. In my in my uh, EICR, I would, would make code it. it if there was a risk to life. Let's say there was equipment that's like, let's say there was some more sensitive equipment, and maybe someone at home used a hoist oh. or used something like that. Totally, and then I'm, the I'm continuity more thinking... of the equipment was vulnerable. I'd code it then, but otherwise, generally, I probably no. I'm thinking it. more. Joe Bloggs lives by himself, one bedroom flat. Um, Probably it's not. an observation. You might want to protect your TV, your iPads, all of your your mixing desks, your computers, etc. I'd recommend this, this, and this in the future when you and do I mean, some work. How much? How much is an SPD from you know reputable companies? Uh, let's say let's say five quid. Let's say let's say from Surge, seventy five quid. About that, I think. Yeah. Uh, it, it, plus the enclosure to fit, or is that with its enclosure and stuff? I think that's enclosure. just for the device. The device. Yeah, yeah, so okay. 100, 100, 100 quid maybe for an enclosure, yeah. etc. So less than two hundred quid. Hopefully. It shouldn't have to be psych you upsell, but it shouldn't. No, it shouldn't be a challenge. Um, you can I am a bit miffed that we're, we're the advice is being given out at the moment um, mm. by CPS is that it's not a requirement of the regulations to um, uh, to even I consider it, which is which is just wrong. It was just me. You don't need to, wasn't it? You don't need to. Yeah. Don't need to. Don't need to. Uh, that's just not the right way to do it. Um, I mean, ask the client. Wrong. Ask the client. Maybe you know. Have you ever had a piece of equipment just break down and you just thought it was bogus? You thought it was broken or something. Clients might have had a couple of people. You know, a, a broken TV, a broken appliance, a broken phone, whatever. You can just and you can just go. Well, do you know what did that? And they can go. Oh, it was just knackered. Oh, it was faulty. Or it was tough. Well, maybe, not. maybe not. You know, I've got two flat screen tellies on my bench at the moment in bits. Um, both of which failed after a lightning strike in the locality. Yeah, got to the house within a few miles of where they were. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah it's, 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 it's the energy, isn't it? It's going into the electrical system in the locality. What we're talking about with SPDs is not direct lightning strikes. We're talking about a lightning Strokes. strike in the locality yeah. mainly. Yeah, it's obviously the after we're talking effect. about switching operations as well. But yes. by far the greater risk is from a lightning strike in the locality. Yeah, it's the term. Was it that I think it's is it eighty percent they say is caused internally, and the other twenty percent is the stroke, which is the after effect of a strike, mm. and is what we're trying to protect against. But um, Jono's just said here the SYD two is about forty quid. 
And a lot of manufacturers are adding requirements for SPDs. Otherwise, they're invalidating warranty. That's definitely what's going to be happening. Insurers, manufacturers, they're going to be hearing this about this new drive for over voltage. Uh, So that's going to become a more evident thing. Um, It's it's going to be mandatory at any time. Industrial, commercial also, I think you're going to find, obviously, Paul, you have them all over the railway anyway. I do have them all over the Um, railway, yeah. And I think we're going to find more in the industrial, commercial and landscape that they're going to become much more prevalent. I can say from personal experience, they are a blinding bit of kit and they do do their job, as long especially as at work. Um, they, yeah. um, they, they constantly blow, which means they must be doing something right. Um, yeah. and that's that's yeah, the electromagnetic it. environments. And we as a, an industry, I think we are going to have to move on from this journey of just talking about thermal events within electrical installations and start talking about electromagnetic events in electrical installations, which goes quite dark and scientific um to say the least yeah i remember that evening talking about it on uh with, with uh, jw oh know. no when, when you consider the emc directive is mentioned now in the 18th edition isn't it yeah mm-hmm. many times but again i've seen training companies where they go oh yeah move on you know you get move four on. four yep. four oh there's only two or three questions here move on so when you've got an opportunity to learn about the material learn about the information the people well, I, it, don't, I, don't I, have I, it I, I'm going to say on this um, this webinar, we've had this discussion that there is a, 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 a growing stir within the industry that we need to reconsider the selection and erection of RCDs in their entirety, given the fact that the connected loads are now potentially uh, interfering. Um, let's not forget that we only commission RCDs. Let's not forget we only commission those to guidance yep. notes three, which says to do them with the equipment disconnected. Yep. So we only test RCDs with the equipment disconnected. So... Which is We're still not going to find that. No. Nope. Well, as you know, I've just rewritten the inspection and testing form, David, and I yeah. sent you a copy of it, and that actually has in in it uh, a consideration of different types of circuit and having the right type of RCD appropriate to the equipment which is connected to the circuit. I've actually mm-hmm. added that into the inspection and testing form now. Yeah, so, I have a good. I, I, think, a good I mean, the forms are woeful that we've got at the moment. I mean, they straight are. from the from yeah, the, minimum. Uh, from we, the regs, they're woeful. We um, should be able to justify not using RCD protection, even though the regs mandates it. We know the reason why they mandate it, because protection against earth leakage is always an enhanced feature that anybody would want to have. The trouble is, is it's pointless having that if we know that there's uh, mutual interference, compatibility issues with connected yeah. loads, which the manufacturers themselves are saying, you must have this immunity. Then you then start to raise the question of, if this is going to be an interference problem, why should I have this protection anyway? There yeah. must be other measures. But well, this is something. Design. Yeah, well, th- I'm going to jump ahead to David's question here then. Go so he says, should we start, and he says, I have already, using DC clamps on type AC RCD protected circuits to see if there is leakage that may leave the device not working? Should yeah, we start good- trying to look at currents? We should, but good luck trying to find a DC clamp meter that will correctly and accurately for that low value DC leakage. Yeah. Trust me, I've been working on this for 18 months with one of the one of the equipment manufacturers. Yeah, it, it is, it it is hard. I think I bet, Paul, 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 can I just take us into into my little world? Yeah. Um, put a clamp meter on, on my oh. railway. Yeah. On his railway. You're going to pick it up. Yeah. We've only got to look at our Instagram feed to see that yeah, we yeah. can measure with this sufficient energy being with released. This one. Yeah, not that one. Um, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, yeah. um, if you I'll look at it. other types, <laughs> look after it, thief. Um, <laughs> if, if there's sufficient energy there, you will be able to clamp on and, and measure it. And, sufficient um, energy, though. That's we, the thing. Just, just to put it in, just put it into context. When when I was working at Poplar Depot, we were yeah. measuring up to a hundred amps of DC energy, and that was the weirdest experiments I'd ever seen because <laughs> we ended up getting these geniuses to come up but with all is... sorts of. But you're talking here tens, hundreds of amps potentially. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. like, but we're worried here with RCDs six milliamps. of six milliamps, yeah. and that is such a low level DC leakage. But meters. we're seeing it now. We are seeing people pick up on it. Just with bog standard. I mean, John Ward's got a ninety quid uh, clamp meter with a DC feature on it, and even he's found DC leakage. You're but not you going to pick up six me. milliamps of leakage correctly and accurately with a meter of that range. At that you're point talking range. about in the purest scientific method of the form i'm talking about sparks using a clamp meter to go right what have i got 
What give give me that that right. sensory okay. sense check? What am I going to find? So let's throw something else into the mix. Okay, here. go for it. Your railway, your, your railway, a traction railway, electrical traction railway is a particular environment yes. where you have external DC influences because you have external DC supplies <laughs> yes. with a shared earthing system. Yes. Because your traction return is, is true earth, yeah? The DC traction return is true earth, yeah? Yeah. So if you have multiple earthing pads around your railway, that true earth, the traction earth through, the, the true, through true earth will find its way back to the traction supply through the loop root of lowest resistance. We're talking about DC now, it's not about resistance. Now that resistance may be up the earth into your, into your distribution board and down the neutral, back to the transformer earth, and then across the track to the DC supply earth. Yeah. If you have a PC, like I have sat alongside me here, which yeah. I nearly threw out the window earlier because it wouldn't turn on properly, that has a live and neutral supply. Yeah. And it has a switchable power supply. Yeah. So how does the DC leakage get from that switch mode power supply to affect my RCD? Uh, you're thinking if it works its way back. Yeah, it yeah, cannot. Yeah, it's, because it if, it it if you get DC that. leakage, that DC is generated by yeah. the, the, the switch mode power supply, which is fed from 50 hertz, pure AC sine wave, yeah, yeah. coming down the line conductor, going back up the neutral conductor. Yeah, yeah. If you have a DC leakage, leaving that power supply to true earth, you will have an imbalance between your line conductor and your neutral conductor, which your RCD should pick up because it's pure AC, because that DC is generated from the pure AC segment coming into that switch mode power supply. So you're saying the DC leakage actually creates an AC imbalance? It's going to, it's got to, because it's not coming from anywhere else. Yeah. It Makes doesn't sense. just magic a pause railway, pause railway. The tr electrical traction railways are a particular environment. Because we have DC supplies for the so, traction. You so know, it's it's a, a difficult one, isn't it? So when you have rectified supplies, it's always going to be equivalent of an AC imbalance due to that leakage because it's yeah. rectified yeah. after. Uh, so it's really not more of a problem when we have more smooth DC generation and into cars. our systems that share a common earthing system like cars and PV that's now going to be stored into systems. Our and that's where we're... Yeah, TV, where we've got yeah. so smooth DC is more the culprit that we're going to be a lot more aware of in the future. Mm. Yeah, and this is the thing: there are different. There's different ways of managing, generating, transforming DC. What Paul's example was absolutely bang on right. The trouble mm. is, is there's so many different types, and we as an industry are not exploring it in enough depth. No, if you, you've got a battery and a fire alarm, that's another source of DC. Exactly, mm -hmm. and 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 what 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 the biggest for me worry is is when you read up. The, uh, and the selection standard for RCDs, and yet they're banned around Europe. They're banned around Europe because something is interfering with them. It's even in the regs about, you know, uh, electromagnetic DC leakage, presence of DC leakage in normal operation. Now, we're actually going to do a podcast where we're going to talk to an electronics engineer to talk about all the various ways that this can happen. And that's, this is in normal operation from capacitors and, you know, build up on printed circuit boards and all sorts of stuff. You, I've, I've spent a lot of time speaking to manufacturers because I'm about to buy a new boiler. Okay, mm. Valiant, mm. Um, Type B RCD, apparently. I've asked the technical manufacturer, um, can you please tell me how much uh, leakage it's uh, generating to um, warrant the the guidance that says Type B? Do you know what I've got from them so far? Gibberish. Nothing. Nothing. It has to go to Germany to the person who designed the product. And that then goes into Paul's world of, have you done the due diligence? And there's someone has done the due diligence to say we need a minimum of type B. And someone has realized that all these super elect microelectronic components, there has been some form of an normal operation or in fault operation, a presence of a DC leakage, which could give rise to harm or danger for the RCD. Yeah, I agree. Stuff like switch mode power supplies in a PC, yes, they're well designed, they're well built. But Paul, you and I both know well, they're, not designed. they're built to a price, mate. That, you know I mean? that design, if we start looking at um, uh, creepage distances, yeah. pollution categories of equipment, environmental conditions, that all goes out the window. But this is, this is, this is stuff, Paul, supply. that we need to talk about on a podcast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, 
be type B it'd be perfect just ban anything else apart from a type B and then they would come down in price and the job's done isn't it so you yes. guys are witnessing why we want to get Paul Skirm on podcasts yes because anyway, he's we have another question. treasure trove of information he is a fountain of biblical knowledge and, and it makes us all better for talking to him right yes. we have a last question uh, Paul do you want to read it you're on to it uh, I'm really so Adri, uh, Adrius Comicus. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. I have my glasses on. I'm really sorry. This is a off topic. But have you mentioned about connect? We mentioned about connect. Have you mentioned about connectors in the back of the light switch? In the scenario, the feed is brought to the switch, and what options do you have apart from WAG or connectors? Well, we did kind of discuss unsupported connectors earlier, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah, five one so seven. He's basically four, saying, what was the solution? Somebody mentioned. I mentioned. I think I mentioned. Uh, Hager light switches. Somebody in the chat mentioned Schneider. Schneider. So ma you know, manufacturers are starting to bring because we know the regulations a couple of editions ago said, "Oh yeah, you never single pole switch." Blah, 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 blah. And then it said neutrals may go to the light switch for electronic switching as a consideration. And that's kind of that was kind of where that was. But now it's, it appears that what we're now doing is we're taking feeds to switches, and we're then going from there off. Mm. Um, mm. But it gets more difficult. manufacturers. Manufacturers are putting neutral terminals in the switches, fixed, and that's what it's you getting, need. It's getting more difficult though because um, you're seeing switches where if you've got say a two gang switch, but it's also involving um, two gang two way, for instance, so you'll have two sets of strappers coming in plus line of neutral. You end up with a very busy box, and and I think we either need to realise that we need to go to um, double gang boxes. Um, maybe. And the, maybe the manufacturers of the boxes, because you and I both know when they design these boxes, I don't think they're ever designed to prevent vibration, movement, dust, whatever, creepage. None no. of this stuff was really considered. And you're right, and some manufacturers are making switches now to terminate neutrals, but neutrals was only ever for um, a, a reference for like smart dimmers and stuff. I was never, ever in all my years on the tools a fan of two plate wiring. Never. Mm. I think ET yeah, 101, the Irish wiring regs now require neutral every switch. Reading Do they some really? Stuff. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Uh, any Irish sparks on? Want to confirm that? We got any Irish sparks on? Anybody's that got contact my dad's house. 101? <laughs> It does explain my dad's house, actually, funny enough, because they've got a neutral at every switch, and it's just a mess of connector blocks. Mm. It'd be worth looking at 60364 itself and see what it says in the area. Dave Betteridge says, the reg says, but a neutral in at switch for future tech. 55951208. So it's a UK-specific reg. So it's in there. There you go. Well done, Dave. Thanks. Mm. Andreas has just said, AM2 requires the same. The AM2 test now requires neutrals at the switches, by the look of it. Dave? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, Chris. Chris Ruddock joints are accessible at light switches. It's a valid point. Um, yeah, true. It's a valid point, but as you say, Paul, <laughs> the the boxes need to obviously be bigger. Yeah, forget you your know. sixteen mil. Think about thirty-five. Put, uh, put more. So put we, more there. Put a bigger box. Stop on. putting plaster depth boxes in. Why do? Why doesn't somebody introduce a box where we can run three core and earth to every single light switch and light and just wire everything in there like you would a central heating wiring center and put that next to a board? Because they need to have your neutral we connection. Spy spider wiring, spider wiring. Well, it's just space. You never know. Uh, not necessarily spider wiring. It's just less, con you know, less conductors um, looping in and out, all back to a, a point of accessibility in luminaire I mean, I, at switch. And at I, I agree. I mean, if the connections are more yeah. readily accessible, more maintainable, then it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, obviously, you can with some switches get quite decorative switches, which might make a bit more of a challenge, but um maybe you know maybe you, you, you try to get um three gangs on a single plate now just double it up go for a bigger bigger space bigger plate i'm pretty sure the standard home in five or six years will just have a double box size light switch in many positions now and i think anyone will look at it twice and go that looks silly and mm -hmm. there'll be more than enough space behind it same spider wire and when paul you said about a like a wiring center like a hexen heating wiring center yeah. What if we put, you know, if what if the future was putting something like that below the board, taking a lighting feed from the board to the wiring center, a, a, a cable out to each switch, and then a cable out to each light? That's a good idea. I think I'm going to do that in my house. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm planning to do. You know, I'm what I mean? literally, I'm, when I change my board here, I am going to put a rather large box with a DIN rail, and I'm going to create a wiring center and run a three core and earth to every single point. That's what I'm going to do. 
and then I'll just, I'll, any unused core, I'll just connect to Earth, sleeve up, available for future use, and then mm. just put it uh, on a wiring schematic and leave it like that and see if that works. Yeah. And Might conduits different. in the wall, conduits in the wall, wiring centre, future-proofed. Yeah, I'm already, don't worry, I'm a big fan of conduits in the wall, my <laughs> missus isn't. Yeah. Do they already do that with some smart lightning systems, Darren Lynn has asked? Um, I think some smart, of them, yes. Like, well, like smart house guys? Chris, or I think they do on they run cat sixes and stuff. You can get I've seen a lot of smart homes now, they just run a cat six and it's all power over ethernet and mm. smart switches, yeah, smart lights. A lot, a lot of them just require a signal. So, what they'll yeah. do is the luminaire will just send a signal, and all it's doing is looking for a return on that pulse. Um, so data is often used with switching in some smart homes now. You don't even have mains voltage in some walls. Just right. you know. we, we, we talked about this at the Elex, didn't we? When we looked at the future of the industry, we looked at you know how much power is available through power over Ethernet, mm. how much power yeah. is required by things like the big even with the big smart alleys now. And we're not far away from not far away, no. That, um, I can't remember the IEEE standard, but it was pushing to 90 watts, I think, is what they were testing at the time. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was 90, 90. power, yeah, uh, for their new standard, um, yeah. All right, guys. Um, any other things you wanted to cover? We've done the questions. We have hit. We must be on two hours. So, um, we're, we're John, past two hours. Is there a reg for yeah. um, David Betridge said? Is there a reg for terminate unused conductor in earth terminal? Conductor. Is there a reg to terminate an unused conductor? So basically, you've got a decommissioned system. You've got cables that are not doing anything. Is there a regulation that says we should earth them, or is there a regulation at all that says we should do something with it? I suppose if you had a three core on Earth and you had one of the cores that wasn't used, what should you do with that? You know? Yeah. Should mm. you connect it to Earth at either end? I always have. I was going to say I always have as well. There's a railway <laughs> regulation that requires that anyway. Um, I've really we've always, we've always done that as good practice. So I can't. I, yeah. I can't pinpoint the reg though, but we've always done it's it as good practice. Right. I think there must be. There must be. A, I mean, I, I mean, could we? Would we go back to the outer street work regulations and look at? Um, the potential of hazards of conductors and induced voltages and say, well, if it has the hazard, uh, or has a, the potential to cause a hazard and poses a risk, then we've got to eliminate that risk. And one of the ways of eliminating that risk is by connecting it to Earth. Yeah. That's, uh, do you know what? I'll have to, we'll have to check that, actually. That's one worth talking about. I know um, what Dave's doing. He's trying, he's trying to ask questions that's going to keep us here online thinking. Oh, thanks, Dave. So he's, he's like that. He's like if the that. new board doesn't have a JW seal of approval sticker, I'll be very disappointed. Um, <laughs> JW seal of approval. We, we, <laughs> funny enough, I have a weird feeling that, that something like that might turn up soon. Yeah. Um, be interesting here about the DC and AC, RCD. Appreciate you get deep. Um, yeah, we're going to do podcasts on. We're going to do. We're going to go deep, uh, uh, Pete, on. C marking, selection of equipment, machinery directives, LV directives, um, everything. Um, Paul will be leading it and we'll just be asking the really silly, dumb questions of how, what does that mean? What does that mean? Um, so that yeah. we're going to record them pretty soon over the next few weeks and then we'll release them in a couple of months. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a minefield. It's a minefield. And the industry knows far more than they're letting on with this. This is something that in this country we are gradually phasing in because of manufacturer pressures as far as i'm concerned um yeah. because we've got i mean christ i've got that uh, the dti um the department of trade and industry report that talks about dc leakage uh, affecting whole current meters in domestic homes smart meters do you remember mm -hmm. that one we had two years ago we had a report that recommends more work is done because there, there was talk about dc in a domestic installation may affect the accuracy of a ct uh, a ct and a domestic what hour meter but it's You're buried well these reports meters. are buried. Yeah. These reports get buried. Uh, it was I want to know where that DC is coming from. You are? I want to know where that DC is coming from. I think everyone wants to. And the trouble is, is no one's paying for the research to do it. Mm. That's the problem. Only the product specific. And that's why we're getting the stupid stuff like type B for boilers. Um, I had a call out intermittent file about RCD tripping. It was in snags and I don't have snags. Do you know what? I don't actually have the snags and solutions books. Not anymore. I have the old, old ones. I had an old set. And my, my, I lent mine out. They never came back to me. And no, it wasn't Jonathan. <laughs> uh, Greg uh, says, no visible main bond to water services, but continuity in 0.03. No code. Or, or C2. What do you reckon? Um, sounds like 
either can't find it or a fortuitous earth. But if I can't find it, I don't declare it as there. Or FA. Yeah, or FA. Right. But it doesn't pass. No. Um, no visible main bond to water, but you have continuity of 0.03. Again, that 0.03 could be... I mean, if you can't actually say what well, that 0.03 is a measurement of, you know, I mean, the, it sounds, if, it sounds like are, it's a cable. If there's bits of equipment connected to the water system, such as yeah. boilers, immersion heaters and stuff like that, you'll be picking up continuity through there. Yeah. If there are, with three the only way CPCs. for telling for sure is to disconnect all of those and then Everything. test again. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Which would be an FI, really. So yeah. it's further investigation, yeah. Yeah. Three zero point nine. Oh, this G, this Gen three and this zero point zero five. Yeah. Value for bonding conductors. Oh uh, yeah, but that's nonsense, isn't it? We, we, yeah, we we've spoken about this before. If you've got a, a bonding conductor which is two meters long and a bonding conductor which is forty meters long, and you get a value of zero point oh five for both, are you happy? I wouldn't be. If yeah, I've yeah. got a two meter long bonding adapter and I get 0. 0.05, I won't be very happy with that. It's, that information needs to go because anyone who's authorized and competent to do this work should know how to read a resistivity table length and calculate. Yeah. Look but, at the length of the cable, that... look at the size of the cable, do the calculation, take your measurement. Yeah. That, do you know what? Does anybody know where that originated from? It originated from being able to prove continuity between the cable, the, the bonding cable, and the, mm. the item that you're bonding. And at the time, the best resolution of the meters that they had was 0.05. Yeah. So that's it, the resolution. So it was down to, well, we're going on the wire here, where, the, where it's connected to the 951 clamp. We're going on the pipe here, the other side of the 951 clamp. We got le we got 0 0.05 or less, because at that level, we can't be sure how the meter's performing. So that's okay. If we've got a good connection. And that's where that point zero five. Just when you think helpful. science can actually prove with beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, it's, it's the limitation of our equipment. Oh, How old is that though? That must be a lot. Oh, that must yeah. be it. 14, 13, 14. Why don't they just throw that out now? Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, yeah. We're very slow to adapt, aren't we? I mean, it's come yeah. in because it's 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 just there to prove that you have a connection from the wire one side of the nine five one clamp. To the pipe, the other side of the nine five one plant, basically. Mm. It's not to do with the connection from the pipe work all the way back to the MET. So sure. you're never going to get that at zero five ohms. All right. Well, I am done, yeah. guys. Anything else you wanted to say or do? Because we need to. It's like two hours now. It's well enough for me. Uh, I'm done. No final words from you, Pop, Paul, Paul. Uh, all the pools and the pop. Okay. All right, guys, thank you for coming in. Thank you for joining. Thank you guys for coming in. Um, if this comes out okay, we'll probably get this thrown onto the E5 YouTube video for you to go and read and refer to later. Um, as punishment. As punishment. But, uh, as punishment, I've... yeah. Another long video. <laughs> <laughs> we call yeah. the long ones on the E5 channel, why don't we? You will watch it. <laughs> you will. But uh, no, I think um, I, I, I enjoy doing these and questions, you know, I learn a lot from these because sometimes, you know, I work in one area and I don't work in others. Um, so we'll do them again. We've got loads of images. We'll get Jono to come on if anyone else wants to come on. David, you're not banned yet. Always welcome. Not yet. Still time. <laughs> yeah, this is time. Um, all right. If there's any other things to say, say them now because I'm about to click the end button. I think... Okay, Bye. guys, remember, if you need to learn any more about your risk assessments, yeah. contact Mr. Paul Skirm, okay? All right. Good night. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. See ya. See you, guys.